All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the September 25th work session for the Charles County Board of Education. Can we please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and uh, Miss Morley is with us virtually for uh, everyone here and folks watching. So first on the agenda, we're going to hear from Miss Acton. And while Miss Acton is coming up and preparing herself, I just wanted um, to introduce this presentation about our systems upgrades many times people understand that as a school system we have to purchase textbooks and hire teachers and figure out our contracts to make sure that we start on time and so forth and so um, two of my chiefs are here to talk to you about the background work that happens to make sure the, that very pivotal things like making sure everybody's paid correctly and on time happens every single day. So we'll be talking a little bit about the backbone of the, um, of the school system infrastructure, which is pivotally important in how we run a, a smooth operation uh, to make sure that we pay our vendors on time, that we are keeping our accounts correct, that we know where every position is. And so I just thought it would be important for the board to get an overview of where we are with this uh, process um, that we fondly call the ERP transition process. So Charmaine, Karen, please take it away. All righty. So good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, Charmaine and I are the project managers for this project. Charmaine has been involved from the beginning, and um, I joined after the product project had already started. So tonight we're going to talk to you about the history of the project. Um, we have three phases of it, so we'll give you the, the status of those three phases. Um, the first one is the ERP, which is basically our financial um, system, HCM, which is HR, payroll, and benefits, and then EPM, which is enterprise performance management or our budgeting planning module. We'll also talk to you about the additional resources that we've needed to implement and um, the additional ongoing resources that we see right now that will probably be needed to keep this project going. So the history of the project, it began in October 2019 with InfoLab, which was our first implementer. Um, as we all know, COVID hit in the spring of 2020, and it, it definitely stalled the implementation. Um, you know, all of us right now are pretty darn good at these WebEx meetings and how to um, share screens and to learn via uh, the web, but at that time we were not that good at it. So, so basically there was a uh, stall in the process. The previous implementer, you know, I don't think that's the only reason that the previous implementer was not successful. I don't think they had the resources. They underestimated the size of our project, wouldn't you say, Charmaine? Yes. Didn't quite have the resources that were needed. Um, we tried to work with them, but ultimately, um, we felt like we were not going to be able to get this implementation um, through to the go live. So we issued a termination letter in February 28 of 2022. The original cost that they had submitted as a bid was $2 million. Four. We had already paid $1 million four basically, so we had about a million dollars left on that original implementation. We issued a new RFP and um, we awarded the project to AST, Application Software Technology, mid-October of 2022 at a cost of $5 million six. So we had a million dollars towards that and, and had an additional cost of $5 million six. The three phases that I spoke about, phase one, which is the financials, it went live July 2022, 2023. HR benefits and payroll is scheduled to go live January 2024 and budgeting and planning February of 2024. So the phase one on the ERP, we had, once we had selected a new implementer, we had discovery sessions that were held in November and December of 2022. We had sprint sessions, which um, 
are basically an in-depth review of the modules. We had all the financial modules at that point that we were reviewing. That happened in February and March of this year. We have a compressed timeline when we had had selected our new implementer because we have some constraints on how long our old financial system and payroll system will be supported. We were running out of time on that. Um, we had testing sessions on the financials in March and April with final testing in May of 2023. We provided uh, training for financial secretary, central office, and school in June of 2023. And then we had a successful go live for the financials in July, on July 10th of 2023. We've had post go live support provided by AST um, through September to fine tune reports and other minor adjustments. The challenge, um, the timeline to go, go live July 2023 was good because it's the end of a, the beginning of a new fiscal year, but it was the end of the old fiscal year. Um, so there were some challenges, which is why we had the support from AST through um, September, because we had to, to prepare our audit in the old system, then transfer everything to the new system, which we are feverishly working to get that done right now. <laughs> Phase two, which is a human capital management. As I mentioned, that's HR benefits and payroll. It kicked off in late February. Um, there was a discovery process at that point to determine what had been done by the previous implementer. They had sprint sessions in early June, and then testing um, and payroll parallel was completed by mid-August. We, we are currently in the second payroll parallel, um, and we will be preparing for user acceptance training. Um, so on, the, on this part of the implementation, as, you, as everyone knows, it's vitally important that all of the payroll be correct. Hmm. We have third-party integrators that are a part of this process. Um, our payroll will be sent to ADP for processing. We've, we've also contact, um, contracted with what's called Time Clock Plus um, to handle the building service workers and the food and nutrition workers because they're hourly folks and it's not handled the way we need it to be in Oracle. So there are some challenges and some risks with that. Um, we have to make sure that um, all of the, the integrations will be ready to go live, and we have to make sure that the conversion process of data, which has been a challenge throughout because our system is so old, um, we tried to hire some additional help to push that across the finish line, but nobody knew how to get that data out of our old system um, other than our we have a uh, current, current arrangement with CMT, which we were able to leverage a little bit to get some help with that, but we have one person to do data conversion. So that has been a challenge, and we have to make sure that everything that goes in is correct because payroll is the end result of that, but if the data going in is not correct, then what comes out of payroll will not be. And for context, the, that system is 40-plus years old, and if you're familiar with old systems it's the black background green print and blueprint so and it's going end of life in january 2024 so definitely it was time to transition and part of the challenge with the data conversion is not only getting it out of the old system which we have have staff that are very adept at doing that but the fields that are required in a new system such as oracle were not necessarily fields that we were capturing in the old system um, wasn't necessary and so it's not in there. So there's been definitely some challenges on the data conversion side. Um, but assuming you know we work out all those details, then we would um, train our staff in November and December and we would go live. It's actually December 10th, which is, it, is the beginning of the first pay period in January. Um, and then we would have support from AST for January and February to fine tune um, reports and minor adjustments after we go live. So phase three is enterprise performance management, which is our budgeting and planning module. Um, that took place in, the discovery took place in August and September. We've communicated our needs to AST as to what we need to be able to develop our budgets and to have a forecasting model that is um, 
more automated than what we have right now, which a lot of it is, is manual. Uh, we have sprint sessions that are planned for staff for, throughout September, and then system integration testing in October and November, user acceptance testing, which is more training and uh, testing in December, and then if all goes well, we would go live in February of, of 2024. The model module will not be used until fiscal year uh, 2026 budgeting because we will have, by February, we will have already needed to develop the next budget cycle. So there is actually time in that process um, to, to be a little bit delayed if it needs to be, um, and also to, to uh, make sure that we've got everything set up for the next budget cycle. So the additional resources needed to implement, um, we have, as I mentioned, um, contracted with some consultants, uh, Numerati Consulting, LLC, which is Oracle Finance, Finance Support, Government Finance Officers Association, which was Project Management Support, which was more in the first implementation yeah. than the second. Um, there was changeover in my position, which left um, Charmaine by herself <laughs> for quite a bit. Yes. Um, so their support was very much needed in, in that project and they were instrumental in, in helping us to evaluate whether we really could bring the first implementation to completion. And then CMT, which has been data conversion support. We've also hired part-time temporary staff to help with the double work in finance and HR um, because this has been a long process. As I said, we started this in 2019, which means other than a, a break of about six months probably with COVID, staff has been doing double work where they're trying to get the system up and running, they're testing it, they're evaluating all the data, and then also having to um, keep up with the day-to-day -day in the old system. And on average, it's been, it's been a lot, 10 to 15 hours of overtime per week um, for the leads in finance and HR. Everybody's pretty exhausted, um, but they've worked really hard to try to make this happen. We did hire a system administrator for the ERP implementation, um, you know, that we're still training and, and bringing up to speed so that we can transition some of those duties um, to that person once AST is, is off-site. So the additional ongoing resources that are needed, um, we have contracted with AST, our current implementer, to do what is called testing as a service. Oracle has uh, quarterly updates for finance and HCM and monthly updates for the budgeting and planning. Um, and what happens when those updates come through is that we need to test them prior to them going into our production environment so that we can make sure that what they've updated didn't accidentally break something on our end that we need to be able to, um, to work. Um, that's, you know, a good thing about an ERP system like this is everything's connected, but the bad thing is everything's connected as well. Um, and when you're on the cloud, you're not able to, to um, come up with a specific uh, program for you. It has to be what everybody else has as well that works within the Oracle environment because when they push updates to us, it would wipe out anything that we tried to customize. So that has been one of the challenges is that we've had to, you know, think creatively how to optimize what Oracle offers um, without really being able to say, you know, I want it to say X, Y, and Z, and Oracle does A, B, and C. We also have contracted managed services through AST to support the system um, once they leave. So the post go live support that they've offered is part of the implementation team that has implemented our system for us. Um, they provided that support for 90 days on the financial end and 60 days on the payroll um, HR benefit side. After that, we'll transition to what's called managed services with them, which is a new team that would be assigned to us um, to help support us because quite frankly, we don't have that expertise in-house to be able to support Oracle. Um, you know, if there's something that comes through on an update that breaks something that, that we already have set up, a report doesn't work anymore, um, those kinds of things, we need support to be able to, to work through those issues. Our hope is in a, in a 
perfect environment that we could hire somebody. Um, this is a three-year contract that we've signed um, because this is very pricey. It would be nice to be able to have someone on staff who has that Oracle Cloud experience um, and not have to contract out for it. In all fairness, we did try to do that with the system administrator, and we were not successful in finding anybody that had that experience that wanted to work for us. Um, or that we could afford. <laughs> right. So, you know, we have three years to try to figure this out and we can cancel this contract if we find that person. Um, but we needed to have a bridge and not lead our, leave ourselves vulnerable. Karen, yeah, and just for clarification to the board, can you clarify what is what we used as we did as we're doing this transition to the system as one time cost versus what we're thinking is going to be reoccurring cost part of our operating budget? So um, this additional ongoing resources, those are definitely part of our operating budget. Um, they're, they're not one-time costs. Um, so the actual implementation, the $5.6 million, the additional cost, which we came to the board earlier in the year and we needed to change the budget to allocate fund balance to cover that, that's a one-time cost and that came out of fund balance. But these ongoing operating costs to maintain the system um, are part of our operating budget moving forward. Um, so we also um, are pretty sure we're going to need another, another uh, system administrator to manage the HCM modules. Um, what we have right now with the ERP system administrator, administrator is a full-time job. Um, so we will evaluate that as, yeah. as we go live, but we're envisioning that we may need another, another person to help with that. Um, there also has to be backup, obviously, because that person's out sick or on vacation and we can't stop what we need to do. Um, so a one-person department doesn't make a lot of sense, and I don't know if you want to talk about that at all. I uh, know, and typically that is the norm in other school districts that have even used systems as sophisticated as Oracle Cloud. They have entire ERP um, departments. Um, so in essence, we're starting out with just one person and eventually growing into the system to fully support it. We'll definitely need additional resource support for the lift because it's, to be honest, and the reason we face so much difficulty looking for an Oracle system administrator, most people with that skill set, they name their price to you and or they work remotely. So to be honest, it was very difficult trying to find someone to fill that role. So even going into looking for additional resources, we're going to have to be creative um, of how we utilize this person, whether on site or a virtual. So. Um, so that's that's an overview. Does anybody have questions for us? Sure. Yeah, I appreciate the the presentation very much. Um, you know, this is something that that has come up not just to this board but the previous board a number of times, and uh, I think it was worthwhile getting a, an update from you. So thank you for that. We'll definitely update you as we move closer to the go live for payroll, HR, and benefits to make sure that there's nothing there that stops us. <laughs> Absolutely. Ms. Butler Washington. Yes, I thank you for the presentation. Um, I just got two questions. Um, the first one um, was, have you considered hiring a um, data specialist within the uh, contract that is provide, who's doing the conversion for you? Because when uh, you're um, pulling stuff from an old system, what we usually do is uh, we rev up our, um, well, we already have it in the project plan where we know we're gonna have to spend that extra money just to get people, multiple people in to be able to transfer that data over because we know we're not going to find new people that know how to do this old system and the company knows that. So it's going to be maybe a, um, something where you have to work out where more people are trying to um, convert that old data into the new system instead of just having that one person. Uh, I have seen that that's been very successful when, um, you know, when we do some, some things on projects where uh, well, I, you know, the organizations I have worked for, when we wrap it up, that has been very successful where they get in, get the work done, and then you can cut it off because you control it. They don't control it. And that's yes. what we did do with yeah. CMT, which is one of the consultants that we talked about. Um, 
we contracted with them to help with the data conversion, but even within their company, even though they were providing us support and they're part of where the support is leaving us, um, they don't have that expertise anymore. Our system is just too old. Mm -hmm. So we had one person in their organization that could help us, and she was, you know, vital to the to the product, um, you know, being completed. But mm -hmm. <clears throat> they didn't have anybody else that could help us either. Yeah, Ms. Acton is exactly right, um, okay. Ms. Butler Washington. We definitely we contracted with that company. So in essence, the one person, the system admin, that person is more supporting roles, provisions, and access. And we also have a person on our data accountability team that works with CMT to pull and convert that data. But because that system is so old, <laughs> uh, it really is the company itself had one person that could do that. And okay. we did also reach out to past employees that had worked for us in uh, the technology department <laughs> to see whether we could beg them to help. Uh -huh. uh, we didn't have any takers, so okay. we, we had to work with what we had. And we were we were grateful to have any help yes. because the one person, um, it, that just wasn't going to work. Yeah. Okay. okay. And then my last question is, um, the person for your cloud. I got some solutions for you. Okay, if you're gonna pull in someone from the uh, special and that with their expertise, number one has got to be remotely, because that's the money piece right there. Yes, we and agree then, with that. And then, then secondly is if you could ask for people who have retired in that um, industry, and put it out as such, you will get a lot of grab because we get a lot of grab. Absolutely. So that could be because they don't want too much money, yeah. because of income taxes and all that. They just want to supplement to pay for something, so they wouldn't ask you for that big ticket as if I would come and say, this is what I would do it for. So they wouldn't ask for that. So we have had a lot of luck in doing that, is asking retirees, because they retire, but they're not really ready to retire. So they still love IT, so that could be something that you can use. Thank you. For thank you. Yep. Thanks. Yes, Ms. Thomas. Um, thank you for that. Um, the in-house training. Do you have anybody in-house trying to train for this? Uh, yes, I'm actually helping with the change management leg of this. So right now we're using resources from AST, okay. as well as training up our own staff to be sort of like uh, super users to support uh -huh. training initiatives. So right now we are using, only because we're so resource thin, a lot of our resources are busy with SIT or payroll parallel and other things, it's difficult to have them facilitate these sessions. So I'm working with AST, they actually facilitating the sessions for our staff, which went very successful the first phase when we were training the secretaries. The other part of training is asynchronous web-based training modules that staff can go and view on their own time. So that's obviously more conducive for mass training larger populations, because trying to train an entire school district um, instructor-led was just almost impossible and very costly so we found that doing the web-based trainings to be more feasible and and the staff have been pretty responsive to okay. those and so you're the only one right now not me it's AST it's AST. a team yeah oh, it's a team but okay. Charmaine is coordinating yeah. with them for us she's oh. leading that um, oh. and the the web-based videos have to me yeah. they've been very easy to to understand and clear and it helps with, like, for instance, principals who have a very busy schedule. They can do it you know, when they have the time and ask questions from it. Um, so I think yeah. that that's been a big help. But we will have the in-person for November and December. Yeah. Um, November is supposed to be at the principals meeting, yes. I think, and then um, further training in December. Yep. Okay. And my other question is, um, I think you were saying with the payroll us user acceptance training. Mm -hmm. So what, what do that what consist of? Sure. Yes. That means that our staff on all levels, HR benefits and payroll, are doing a final test on the system and making sure that the configurations that we've communicated to, to our implementer and that they have implemented are going to work and provide the result that we're looking for. So it's basically a final testing. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lucas. Just briefly, I wanted to talk about the additional resources that are needed. In terms of the two three-year contracts that I see here, is this a total of how much is needed for three years, or it's this is the annual cost for three years? So the 375 
approximate for AST. Those, those are the three updates. year costs. That's the yeah, full, the total, okay. Total. Yeah. Same thing with the AST yeah. management ser managed services, yeah. okay. Excuse me. <clears throat> in terms of additional resources, you mentioned kind of the, the staff is sort of at capacity and they're sort of dipping into overtime. Do we know about for how long they'll have to sustain that level of overtime? Um, on the financial side that went live in July, um, part of the, the challenge, there's additional work still right now because payroll is not in the system. So we have to man kind of manually get that conversion and it has to be uploaded into the system and there's a lot of, of tracking there. So to be honest, I think it probably, it will be less for the financial side between now and, and January, but it'll still exist and for HR benefits and um, payroll, it's going to continue probably at least through March. Okay. And it depends on when we are able to integrate the time clocks plus that right now is um, looking like it will be delayed. We have a backup plan as to how to, to um, enter the time for, the, for those folks if time clock plus is not integrated, but if that is if there is a delay there, we probably are gonna have to um, extend the amount of time that AST w is with us at a cost. We'd have to have a change order for that. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there, there will be significant testing again at that point to make sure that that's integrated properly and that the configurations are right. Okay. So it probably will go through March. And you mentioned, uh, well, thank you for that. You mentioned testing in terms of the system is only as good as the accuracy of the data that goes in. Mm -hmm. Will there be, like, how would you all know if, like, one or two records weren't augmented or there was an issue with them at so the outset? Are you speaking, like, in particular about the payroll side? Yes. Um, so we are, we're currently in the second round of um, payroll parallel test testing. So first we test all of the gross wages to see if they're correct mm -hmm. within, we have like a $3 range, not down to the penny because every system is gonna be a little bit different in the calculations of it and, and also when you get to taxes, um, their tax tables may be a little bit different than ours. So at that point we look at the, the gross, which we have matches on, so that's fine. Um, then we get down to the net to see if, if the pre-tax net um, and then that's where we're seeing more of the, the um, differences at this point. And that's because you're talking about benefits coming into Oracle where there could be missing data. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the issues that, that we have um, found. We have a, um, a joint meeting, two of them scheduled this week, where we're going to have HR benefits, payroll, and the finance team all on the same calls to make sure that we're um, understanding how it intersects and what the problems are with the data and how we correct it or we make sure that it's going to still be okay once it goes to Oracle. Um, so that's what we do and then evaluate the, the net pay. We are going to start what we call a um, change management communication with staff um, mm -hmm. in another week or two. We want to get through the payroll parallel and make sure that we are confident that we're going to go live in December um, so that we can communicate to staff things that will be different with the new system, such as tax tables, um, such as another issue that I know we will have to be real clear on, and I don't think I've mentioned it yet, but I'll mention it right now, is um, we have an employee portal where the paychecks get posted, and staff is used to being able to see those paychecks. So for Friday's paycheck, they're used to being able to see it on Monday. Um, and they get kind of upset when it's not there on Monday. But that's probably not gonna be how it's gonna be with because we have to send it to ADP and it's actually ADP um, that is cutting the checks or sending the ACH mm -hmm. and then they have to post it. So that's gonna be like a really important thing to communicate because um, folks start emailing us continuously over the weekend and on Mondays that their payroll isn't, their check isn't in there. So we, there are things like that that we need to communicate. Nope. There's some- I appreciate and love proactive communication, so appreciate yeah. that change management communication. And there's some differences in the tax tables as far as on the state side. Um, you know, if, if you started working for us and you lived in La Plata, so your address with payroll says La Plata and you have filled out your tax form that says Charles County tax comes out. 
Well, Oracle was smart enough that now if you've changed your address to St. Mary's County, it's gonna start taking out St. Mary's County tax on you. But if you didn't change your, your tax form with us, we didn't take out St. Mary's County. Mm -hmm. So there will be some differences like that that we have to alert people to that, um, you know, if you moved and didn't update your tax forms, it's gonna take the right tax out, but it'll be different than what you saw before. Understood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's probably too much detail. To no, I, I was Sorry. with it. I didn't, I didn't know the acronyms, but I was definitely with you. Ms. <laughs> Creamer. Thank you so much for the presentation, and I'll be brief. I just have a couple of questions. So one, um, the impact for the additional staff that you're saying is going to be required um, to help with implementation, is that included in the total cost of implementation, or is that in addition to? That's in addition to. So the amounts that I've quoted in here is what we paid the implementer, not the additional overtime that had to be paid mm -hmm. um, for staff to be able to put in those hours. Okay, and do we know what the impact of that is? No, not sure. I, okay. I could get an estimate for you, but I don't. But but in fairness, I don't know that I can really get an estimate for you because some of those folks are exempt employees, so they were not paid overtime, but they had to to work it. So gotcha. the only thing that would be captured would be those um, that you know did put in were able to put in for the overtime. So okay. It wouldn't be complete. So was it just overtime, or did I thought we needed also to hire additional staff? Did I misunderstand that? No, you're right. We do have that. I could could get for you as far as temporary staff that was hired um, in HR and um, finance. Okay. Yeah. That would that, that, that would be helpful. Help. Thank you. Appreciate that. And then my other question is: during the the project plan, is there something included, uh, you know, part of the testing phase or or something like that, where the staff can provide feedback and it, you know, mm -hmm. from using the system and then is there some sort of like ticketing system set up so we can track like issues and yes. things that need, okay. Yes. Yeah. On our, um, we have an internal SharePoint site, which okay. A on that, they can submit, you know, whatever concerns they have. We also have it linked through our help desk ticketing system where people need support and they're routed to the appropriate person for that. So yes, with our, it's kind of like our change management for the ERP, mm -hmm. uh, people can submit comments or um, praise or <laughs> concerns. I hate this system, it's not, or I love it, it's great. Um, but for the most part, people are excited. Yeah. They're like, let's get away from this paper. Well, from 40 years old, a yeah. uh, 40 year old system, I, I can imagine it wouldn't take a whole lot to yeah. but be an improvement. The, yeah, and, so. And for the folks where it's, it's been engraved in their DNA. That's the only thing they know. Those mm -hmm. are the folks that we just have to handhold a little bit more mm -hmm. because it's it's definitely different. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where we are with that. Yeah. No. Understood. I just wanted to make sure that the staff would have an opportunity to. Obviously, they're the ones that are going to be using this on the day to day basis. Make sure that they're having an opportunity to provide feedback early on when we still have, you know, within that two month period where we still can make some changes and you know kind of fine tune um, with with that that um, support from the company. And tracking kind of went throughout the whole project through all of the testing. Um, and, you know, as Charmaine said, they opened up tickets for anything that we had a concern about or anything that wasn't working. Um, and then we went through the process of working, um, resolving it and closing them out so that there was always a record of it from the okay. very beginning. Great. Thank you for that. I think that's great. I think, obviously, like I said, a 40-year-old system, it was well overdue, right? And so I um, just want to echo what Dr. Navarro said in the beginning, that obviously this is something that probably is in the background and people don't think about a lot, but super important, obviously, to our operations. So just want to thank you all for the hard work that you all have done. I know that how important this is and how, I'm sure, tedious it has been. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Mr. Hancock. Question. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for the presentation. I just have a quick question, um, just something I'm interested in. Um, when the original contract was it was um, given to InfoLob, and we paid them the little over 1.3 million dollars of of what um, what the total cost would have been for them to complete the job, was there anything that we were able to retain out of yes. that? software wise yes. or anything so else everything that they developed was ours okay and so the new implementer was able to use that and build from it so we paid both of the contracts were um you pay based on deliverables 
So they had completed certain things that we had reimbursed them for, which is the money that we paid them for. Good. And then the new implementer was able to take it from there. The part of that discovery um, process was the new implementer actually being able to see what's been done mm -hmm. and us communicating what needed to be done so they could figure out um, you know, what else needed to happen. Um, and so the original cost, if we had been with this implementer from the beginning, would have been higher is been what more. we're saying. Absolutely. Okay. Yep, that makes sense. That's, that's good to know because yeah, as you look at it, you kind of just think, oh, wow, we, we wasted, we wasted yeah. $1.3 million. But that makes sense that so we were able to retain and use some of the software and what was provided and that cut down on the, the total cost of the Absolutely. contract Absolutely. we're using now. Absolutely. And in hindsight, um, the, the previous implementer that was not success, successful, it was a very low amount. Yeah, it looks um, like. Yeah. I, I think they really underestimated the scope of the, of the work. Mm -hmm. And so it became clear that they didn't have the resources yeah. to really, you know, get this. They were trying. Sure. I mean, they yeah. really were trying, but, you know, they just didn't have the um, depth of staff to, or experience to really be able to do it. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. That, that helps a lot. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Charmaine. All right. Next, we're going to hear from Ms. McKinnon. Good evening. How are you? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm here this evening to talk to you about special education and um, an overview of what we do and how we do it. I'm going to go ahead and get started. So in, I'm sorry. Go ahead, I'm sorry. In the Department of Special Education, we have um, our mission and our vision. And it is, uh, to summarize our mission, we're supporting teaching and learning. That's number one, by developing and delivering specially designed instruction and coaching staff. That, that's what we are seeking to do. And we're gonna do that by understanding the abilities of the people in our, in our schools um, and we're gonna educate them to self-advocate while being challenged, staff and students, advance their potential for meaningful community engagement, independent living, employment, and college or career. In order to do that, um, we've committed. These are the people in my department in special education leadership. We're going to coach, we're going to increase the capacity, which is an ongoing struggle with the long-term subs and conditional teachers. We're gonna take responsibility for um, what we need to do, for the mandates that the state sends us, for the data that we receive countywide, and we're gonna advocate for what we need and what students need. We're gonna do that by preparing competent professionals and stakeholders and applying research-based knowledge. So although, um, we talk about what we're going to do, and we plan to do those things. Um, plans are nothing, but planning is everything. How are we going to do it? Let's talk about that. So with special education, there is a process for getting into special education, for students going, becoming entitled to services, because it's not an eligible situation. They are eligible, and then they're entitled to services, which means we must provide them. They don't have to ask for them. So there's a referral process that comes from the general education world. And it could come from a parent, it could come from a teacher, it could come from a, a SST committee at a school, a student support team. And then it goes through formal assessments. Oftentimes, those are paired with informal assessments like classroom-based things. Um, the formal assessments look at social emotional behavioral things, functional abilities, academics, and cognition. And then we move to eligibility, where there are 14 IDEA eligibility categories. A lot of you have heard of dyslexia. It's not a category on its own. It's under specific learning disability. I just wanna make that known. We don't ignore dyslexia. It is simply included under specific learning disability. And then um, developmental delay is through eight years and 
eight years, 12 months. Eight years, 11 months. Eight years, 12 months is nine. So eight years, 11 months, and we have to tease it out. And um, the multiple disability is also a disability category where people often have questions, and some of the uh, mandates and constraints around the kind of disabilities that can be considered multiple has changed. So how do we go through this process and reach these students in our schools? Well, every school needs to have a continuum of services. That means from um, a student who is in a co-teaching model with a general educator, educator and a special education and cater in a general education classroom to small groups to um, a consultative model. The small group will be self-contained. It will be all students with special education. And when we consult, we work with the staff mainly to say, how are you embedding a language-rich environment? How are you embedding social-emotional learning skills for these students who you have who require direct, explicit instruction around how to manage the behavior? We can hold on for a minute. If anyone has any questions about uh, identifying students for special education services, I think that's a, an area that some people get confused as to you know, this person's struggling, why aren't they special ed? And this person, they were struggling and they were identified for special education. So I don't know if anyone has any questions so that we can clarify some questions. The purpose of today is really to give an overview, but also to answer any questions. Sure, Ms. Butler Washington. Yes, um, that struck me too, because um, we used to know what category um, special ed, but now I know things have changed. But has it been, um, uh, could we do better by putting something on the website to, to, you know, direct parents to this is what is required, this is what is not required. So the part that is what's not required, they can then go and get the help that their child needs. Because I think it's a, it's a big um, a myth of all of these things are, are categories that special and they should be doing, the school should be doing it, when in reality we have... Um, gotten a better understanding of special ed needs and we have a category of knowing what is and what is not so could it be something where we can put out to the parents to just to say you know this is what special ed is considered in the help that your child need this what we thought was is not so that will lead the uh, parent into being able to you know go further with their doctors or whomever they need to go to get extra help for their child and not expecting the, the school to do it because when we went to school, this was and this is not. An ongoing concern with special education is we have to stay away from blankets. So we can't say this is all for you or this is how we do this for all people. That individualized piece is very important. So putting something on the website saying this is what it is and this isn't what it is, um, wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do that because of the blanket and, and the something called predetermination and us saying, well, no, unless you check these boxes, you won't get special education. MSDE would slap our hand really hard for that. So instead, we give the parents avenues to have those conversations. I attend every CCAC meeting, Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee. I attend every one of those, and on the CCAC website now, which is embedded in CCBOE and special ed pages, is um, a question and a asking questions sheet. So you can put your concern in there. And prior to every CCAC meeting, I meet with the CCAC board because sometimes parents take questions directly to them and we don't want to do that. We want to, I'm, I'm making sure I didn't accidentally answer my phone, sorry. Um, we didn't want to, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to have them be, we want to talk about I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Oh, with the CCAC board. I meet with them prior to every CCAC meeting to go over the agenda, see what parents want me to talk about, want to hear about, and the parents that have gone to them, at those times, we discuss the answers to those questions, and they relay the messages through their community forums and things of that nature. Am I being clear? Mm -hmm. But that's just one avenue, but how, do we provide other avenues for parents who do not attend those? Because we have a lot of parents that don't attend those. 
Um, in the past couple of years, the, my first year here, because I'm beginning my third year, I had listen and learns with families four times a year. My second year, I call them collaborative conversations because they're probably like, Tia, you've learned now. How are we going to fix things? So we had collaborative conversations. This year, I am morphing that into a director's council. So um, sets of parents can meet with me in a more intimate um, setting and we can have and I know who's coming and what issues we want to discuss so those directors councils will be around issues like directors council for discipline directors council for accommodations you know things of that na nature so that's what I'm that's I make those available and I send those out through our monthly newsletter that um, is sent like a school's newsletter is sent to all families with students with disabilities. Ms. Butler Washington, just to get clarification, are you talking about the process itself that parents are confused on how to go through the process? And yes, so we should those be putting that process and we can get the, the process itself on how to be identified for special education and clean that up and make sure parents understand the process and where to go if they think suspect that their child has a disability. MSDE did just come out with some new um, booklets that um, I sent out in the newsletter, but I can actually get them added to our web page as well. And they come in multiple languages. I actually yes. was going to mention those MSD pamphlets. There's no need to recreate the wheel. Yeah. They have beautiful graphics. Yes. They kind of go through what would you ask for? What could you see? And it kind of goes step by step. I saw it um, and I was actually very um, pleasantly surprised. Yes. Well, you answered my question, and it was more like for the public, because I do follow you. Because uh, I get a lot of questions, and by going to your, um, your page, I can finagle and make them sure they go to you for those questions. So this was more for the public to know that, you know, we are advocating and putting out information multiple ways so parents can understand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey, Ms. Morley, I can't tell if you have your hand raised or not. If you were able to chime oh, in. Oh, I did. Okay. I think I'll just jump in because yeah. I realize you can't see me. The PowerPoint yeah. is probably up. Um, yeah. But thank you all, um, and Dr. McKinnon, for this presentation. Um, I've also gotten, I, as recently as last week, uh, questions around special education um, because uh, for parents, it is such a difficult um, area to navigate, and it can seem very, very overwhelming. I know that you can't give specifics, but when you talk about the process with referral assessment eligibility, can you give generally an idea of how long that might take? Understanding that there are you know, highs and lows, um, but you know, let's say hypothetically, you know, little Susie starts school um, today and the teacher suspects something might be going on um, and, and she may need additional support. What would that look like? From the moment we see the, receive the referral, we have 90 days to complete the process to either find the student eligible or find that the student is not eligible. Um, so we have 30 days to have that meeting to, we call it screening, to figure out what are the areas that a student is showing weakness that we need to investigate. And then we have 30 more days to go to, an, to do the assessments, to complete them and present them to the parents or families. And if a student is found eligible for, eligible for a specific disability, then we have 30 days to develop an IEP. So that process can't take longer than 90 days. And we have, um, we are monitored by MSDE with that data and it's reported out annually. Appreciate that, thank you. And I understand that this from year to year, you know, as a student, you know, grows and changes is also going to change. What kind of on, ongoing support and guidance is provided to the parents? Once a student is found eligible um, for special education services, they do get assigned a case manager. That case manager is a direct liaison to, sorry, I'm looking at the owl, um, a direct liaison to the, um, to the, for the families. Um, and they, they can answer the questions. At that time, they have access to the parent center um, newsletter, the Parent Center Resources that has workshops on IEP 101 and how to um, work with students with autism or various things. We've paired this year a lot with St. Mary's County and making sure the parents get access to information. And then they also have CCAC ongoing and they have, um, they have access to the instructional specialists and everyone in special ed leadership. So it's um, 
And I think the other thing is that yearly they have an annual IEP meeting, individualized education plan, where they review the plan that's already been made for the students with the special education services on that plan. And they discuss at that time whether that's still an appropriate plan or whether they need to add or subtract services from there. So they do look at every individual child that has special education services once a year. At least okay. once a year. Go ahead. I was saying at least once a year. At least once a year, okay. And if the parent has an issue, like for example, a parent came to me very recently regarding her son's 504, where do they start? Who's the first point of contact? Is it the teacher? You know, do they contact the team as a whole? How does that work? If a parent has concerns whether about their child having a disability of any sort, they should ask, they should contact their principal and let them know of their concerns. And um, then the school team will be able to work with them to decide which route they're going to take. Whether they want assessment, whether it's tutoring or some of our extended learning opportunities, um, it, it runs the gamut on what the additional resources. It could be a, a slight change in schedule that um, is able to support the student. And is that the same if they have an existing uh, plan in place? The principal should be the first point of contact? It, I guess it depends on what the concern is. If they, if they have a plan in place, they should contact the facilitator of that plan. It could be the case manager or the 504 facilitator. The classroom teacher will be able to point them in the right direction. And one other, this is more of a comment than a question. Um, when I used to do facilitations, I did quite a few volunteer IEP facilitations, which is offered free of service if parents are not aware. Um, this was in Montgomery County, so I'd have to verify, unless you already know, if it's also offered through community mediation in Charles County. And this person is not an advocate. Um, and I know sometimes parents feel like they need an advocate, but if a parent is looking for someone just to better help them understand the process, to ensure that their questions are addressed, to ensure that they leave there with the same understanding, that is a service that um, can be provided to them free of charge as well. Yes, MSDE provides it free of charge for every LEA in Maryland. I will include that information in my next newsletter because you're right, parents don't know that it exists and don't <coughs> frequently avail themselves of that service. But MSDE at our director's meetings have been pushing that like, hey, we're here, use us. So I will make sure to include that and get that word out. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kramer. Thank you, Dr. McKinnon, for this. Um, just, I know you have more of a presentation to go through, but just on the eligibility piece, I just wanted to ask a quick question about that. Um, some of the questions that I get or uh, not even necessarily questions, but situations that are brought to my attention are when parents are trying to get their child evaluated for services, and perhaps there may be a disagreement about, say, like the pediatrician says, I think you should have your child evaluated for, you know, X, Y, Z situation or, or whatever, or um, they're suspected maybe autism, maybe a developmental delay, what have you. Um, and then, you know, they go through the process with the school and the school says, no, we don't identify, you know, we, we don't agree, we don't, you know, we're, we're not seeing evidence of that or they don't meet the eligibility criteria or whatever the case may be. So there's a disagreement about what the needs of the child are. What happens at that point? So if the parent says, I don't agree, I think my child does re require special education services and the school says, well, we did the evaluation and we don't find that. Do you see that situation? And if you do, I'm sure you do. Um, how is that handled? Absolutely, we see it. And the parents are encouraged at that time to initiate their parental rights. And um, that goes through our director of compliance and our compliance office. And it's various levels of um, due process that they can seek. It can be an administrative review. And that was someone outside of the school looks at the case and sees if there were any missing pieces that the, the school team could further review. It could be a mediation where someone from outside of the county, an ALJ, listens to both sides and says, well, you know, I think it's, you know, they try to come to a, an agreement and agree on what's going to happen for the student. And that goes all the way up to an actual due process hearing that could be you know, something that's initiated by families as well. That doesn't happen much in this county because we can usually um, me mediate the disagreements prior to that step, but it is something at parents' disposal. 
Okay, and so we do educate the parents on their rights yes. to appeal, I guess, or have at it reevaluated. We discuss that at the beginning and give them a contact information. Great, thank you for that. Okay. Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'll be brief, because um, I definitely want to get to the rest of the presentation. Um, definitely support and echo the sentiments and questions of my colleagues around the process and just making sure that although we may understand the process, families who are either new to their child being identified or even more seasoned, this is a very complex process and we all want the best for our children. So we as a school system have to make sure that we're doing our level best to ensure that families truly understand what the process is and what the services are that are provided. Um, so definitely appreciate my colleagues for flagging that um, through a variety, several of them did so. Um, this is more of a request going forward in your presentation. I know you mentioned St. Mary's. Uh, several years ago, I proposed to our commissioners, delegates, and our state senator that we have a hub for Kennedy Creek or a Southern Maryland hub right here in Charles County. So I was elated when St. Mary's got it, um, but I know that we're also able to provide services from Charles County through St. Mary's through that Kennedy Krieger sort of satellite office. So if possible, if you can mention how, what that looks like or how that's possible, I would appreciate it. And if not, it's a second, pre another presentation. I understand that as well. Um, quickly, we, we use their, we, we, are all, we have always been able to tap into Kennedy Krieger's expertise. Mm -hmm. They're working with our early intervention right now on conscious discipline. They're working with our self-contained um, early intervention, three-year-olds. Um, they have supported us with behavior um, strategies around stu sometimes students, sometimes programs. Mm -hmm. um, and we will be able to access more of that expertise once the staff at the Southern Maryland office or location is trained up to be um, what Kennedy Krieger wants them to be. They weren't able to move a lot of staff existing staff down here so it's new staff and they're still in the process of training them as they are you know still supporting the i believe they have nine six or nine students that attend i think it's just an exciting opportunity for many of our Absolutely. families as opposed to having com to commute that hour and a half one direction to baltimore they now have that opportunity right there in st mary's so very excited for the families here and myself and the directors of st mary's and calvert are getting a private tour on october 11th so I'll have more to share after that. Let us know if some board members can attend. <laughs> <laughs> All right, please continue. In addition to um, what the teachers are doing and that staffing and providing the continuum, they're also responsible for, as we mentioned, assessments, IEP meetings, service coordination, uh, medical assistance requirements, accessing community resources, which we call community-based instruction, and job development, especially for our students and adult programs. As of September 20th, there were still 35 special education teaching vacancies in Charles County Public Schools. On a typical year, typical being a while ago, 13 is where we typically sit, because special education has always historically been an area where we um, aren't fully staffed. But this is, you know, worse in this case. Um, we have pre-K, we just have one though. And elementary, there are 15 resource teacher vacancies. At middle school, there are 13. And at high school, there are six. One of those six is a compliance facilitator. So it's not a classroom teacher, but it's still a, a, a source that is important to the school and it's functioning and providing um, special education students with the support that they need. Roughly how many students do we have under special education? 3,143. Okay. That was better than approximate. Yeah. <laughs> 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 checks it every day. <laughs> okay, thank you. No problem. So along with our services that are housed at every school, that's, that students can access at every school, we have some regionalized services. The first one is emotional adjustment, or you may hear it referred to as EA. This set of services supports students who have social, emotional, behavioral difficulties. They can be self-contained or can be included. They have access, direct access to a school psychologist and um, some expert, they work with teachers who have, are, are gaining expertise in working with students and their behaviors. And we try to keep those students in this, their seats at school, um, work with them through problem solving. It's a language-based problem solving model, so the students that are participating in EA are typically average cognitively. The learning isn't their biggest need. 
And then we have Achieve. Achieve students are those students who are pursuing alternate learning outcomes. It is for every um, grade level we have, although. Explain alternative learning outcomes. Oh, okay, sorry. Alternative <laughs> learning outcomes are, it, you know, there's one curriculum. There's one set of standards that we all have. So for students who, it is determined that given the amount of extensive support and modification that they require based on their academic, cognitive, and functional profile, that they wouldn't be able to access all those grade level standards. So a first grader, fifth grader, there may be 35 standards that they need to master in fifth grade. For students pursuing alternate learning outcomes, they may, we may reduce that to 10 or 15, and we take out the um, abstract concepts, such as justice, and just focus on the concrete concepts, such as um, law. It's concrete to me. <laughs> um, and so those students are pursuing a certificate of attendance, which um, they can use for all of the categories that we mentioned in our mission. They can use it to go to higher education, they can use it to go to jobs, um, and it work in the community, and jo <laughs> participate in a career. The only thing you can't do at this point, because I think the waiver is lifted, is go directly into the military. You have to do some extra things. For a while, you could even do that. So, And then we have our SOAR services. SOAR services are students who are pursuing a high school diploma, but they have characteristics or have been found eligible as students on the autism spectrum. So they have executive functioning needs. Um, sometimes they perseverate on things and they need help getting unstuck. Um, and so these are the students that are most successful with those services. And then we have our ACE or adult programs. Adult programs has three um, categories. Okay, that I'm gonna go over in a little bit. It's on a different slide, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> and then our early intervention, we have infant and toddler and we have the preschool special education. So the school system, we're responsible from birth to 21. I just wanna make sure everyone is, understands that, mm -hmm. so. In infant and toddler, students receive services in their home or in the community. And as, at preschool, they start coming to us. Now, four-year-olds all day, soon, three-year-olds all day. And then we also have some low incident services. Um, low incidence is just a term for disabilities that are low in number. So our DHOH, or deaf and hard of hearing population, and our um, blind or visually impaired population. Here we go, adult programs. So in addition to the other things, these are our students who are 18 or older, 18, 18 through their 21st birthday. They could be an AIP, which they spend most of their day on job sites. That's adult independence program. And then we have adult living skills, where they focus more on accessing their community, visiting um, adult sites so they can transition to once they age out of school. Because once, in a big focus for ALS students is going from that entitlement to eligibility. In the adult world, in the next 70 years, they aren't entitled. So they have to really learn how to navigate. Their parents and them have to learn how to navigate the systems. We cover that a lot in the expo every year for parents. And we work with students on getting them to the level where they can access some services because they can say no. So if you need to be travel trained, we get you travel trained. And then we have ACS. When they spend three to four days in the community learning about pre-vocational skills, and community access. So those are the students who are most needy and will probably transition into supported adult living when they leave us. So what do we do? How do we do all this stuff? Well, this is how we support our schools. In our department, we have two content specialists, one for elementary, one for secondary. The elementary content specialist, Ms. Cook is able to um, she also works with the summer, and the summer programs for students with disabilities. And our secondary um, content specialist is Mr. Larry Johnson, who participates heavily on the professional learning team in working with our professional learning initiatives and our professional learning opportunities that we provide, in addition to having schools that are supported. 
we have instructional specialists and behavioral specialists. Unfortunately, we have two vacancies in our instructional specialists due to the hiring freeze. And um, on a positive note, behavior, we're currently this week onboarding behavior technicians to support our behavior specialists to increase um, schools access to us. We can get to more schools, we can do more fidelity checks, we can train staff on more strategies. So we're excited about that change. <laughs> Each of our regionalized programs has a coordinator and or an instructional specialist that works with them and um, they are listed on the screen and um, that's the first area that parents can access when they have concerns when the students participate in those programs and then there's me. I think one of the things that, that families sometimes have a difficult understanding is, is that these programs are not boxes where every student fits into a perfect program. That our students are varied and have individual needs. And so then uh, it's up to the school system and the IEP team to identify where is that best placement along that continuum of services so that student can reach the services that have been identified on the IEP. And what a day looks like for the people on the previous screen and and this screen is there, they're not here. Although they have desks upstairs on the second floor near my office, they're not here. They're out in schools every single day, especially with the vacancies. So the instructional specialists support about six schools each, and our co coordinators support their entire program. Like you know, for Achieve, that's 35 classrooms. So she and the instructional specialists are out doing that work. Um, some of you may know that our non, some students we um, send to non public schools, right now they're 44. And some students don't have placements yet. And we, we, are, we can't tell them they can't come to school. We welcome them to school. So supporting our few, four students that ha don't yet have a placement is something that um, the coordinators have been working heavily with. Yeah, Ms. Smith. So you mentioned services. Um, and I know that you mentioned for the earlier grades in the, I'm trying to remember, Pre, it's toddler, the infant and toddler stage where the services are in the home versus the preschool stage in which the services are mostly in school. Yes. Uh, we know that nationally there are, there's a shortage of service providers, whether it's audiologists or physical therapists or speech therapists. So I'm just curious, have we seen the impact um, here in Charles County in terms of having limited specialists to do the work, whether it's pushing at home or pushing at school? In Charles County, in that area, we have been, I wouldn't say lucky, but we have been, um, I guess lucky, <laughs> to, um, we have an audiologist. Our OTs and PTs are fully staffed. We just onboarded our last OT. So we didn't start the year fully staffed. We needed one more. And what we've had to access in order to do that is contracted services. So we have professionals who, in OT and PT, Providing that virtually just isn't ideal. So they are all, they all come to us and they're in person. With our speech language pathologists, we have quite a few that provide um, speech language pathology, pathology services, tele, and with using a telehealth platform. And um, in order to support that, this year I allocated a support person. I call, we, call, we decided to term it a speech language IA who's responsible for getting the kids together, making sure they're log on, log on and access that. Because without that additional person in the school to do it, there just wasn't the resource to get the students logged on. So the teletherapist would sit there without students. Mm. So that has been how we have been able to um, stay fully, get and remain fully staffed in our related services. But we do have in-person speech pathologist, yes. a student mm -hmm. cannot access the service online. Uh, they make sure that that person gets uh, in-person going to the school to provide the services. And our family, just a follow-up question, are families able to determine, or decide, excuse me, long day, are families able to decide if they prefer in-person versus teleservices, or? Parents are, families are definitely allowed to have their preference. 
now. We do, sometimes we're able to provide that and sometimes we are not. Like Mr. Lowndes alluded to, every school has an in-person SLP assigned to it, maybe not providing the services, mm -hmm. but that in-person SLP is there. We just go through some problem solving with the families if they say no, because before we started, a lot of families said, no, I, my child cannot access this. When I, at COVID, I watched them, it's not, it's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And we walk them through, we say, well, how about we try it and see how it goes, see if there's progress. If there's not progress and we have evidence it doesn't work, then we'll move here. What do you think the barriers will be? What do you, so you know, those um, kinds of pieces. And for the most part, parents have been um, convinced or have seen the benefits that teletherapy can have. And we share the literature with them that nationally, there isn't a difference. There hasn't, there ha people haven't seen a difference in the teletherapy for speech language mm -hmm. and the in-person therapy. Students have been able to make as much or more growth. It, it's interesting because with the, there is a shortage of speech language pathologists and these outside contractors have been able to attract folks to work for them because of the telehealth. Like they use that as an incentive. As this is, if you come to work for us as a contractor, you'll be able to work telehealth. So in the past, you know, there used to be in-person contractors through SLP, but I think what we're seeing now is more and more of these companies are offering the, tele the telehealth services. And so more and more school districts are having to go that way. And they're providing in-person support to be with the child while they're getting the speech language pathologist like uh, Dr. McKenna said, but the actual service provider is, is somewhere else on a computer. Thank you. Before I forget, Ms. Moore Lee, do you have any questions? There's one quick question. Um, if or how does, do these services look different at a community school? I know that you know we're just ramping um, several of those up. I'm just curious if that changes anything. The community schools offer some wraparound services that aren't available at every school. So the access to the health care, the access to the mental health supports, access to those things are, are what the difference is. It's not a difference in the IEP special education world um, as far as community schools are concerned, but what the school has to offer given its status as a community school is different. And to be clear, that's that's based solely on the, the I'll say the economic standard that, that is set to to mark that as a community school. Yeah, and I and I just want to say that a lot of I was skimming through our plans. A lot of the community schools are meeting basic need of families, and and some of the things that they're dealing with health are first somatic um, health needs. So your eye exam, your dental exam. Um, you know, more of those routine health care needs, and then there is a little bit of some behavioral, um, additional behavioral uh, uh, support, but it's a lot of somatic um, um, health care. And, and I just want to reiterate what Dr. McKenna said so everyone understands that, you know, if it's on the IEP, legally we have to provide that service. So whether it's in a school with community school or a school that doesn't have a community school, if it's on that IEP plan, we have to provide that service. Yeah. I saw a hand. Yeah, I wanted to say Dr. Navarro hit the nail on the head that it's it's more of the the dental, the eye exams. That I, I was just curious because there hopefully are more services offered at a community school for the mental health piece. So I was trying to see if, if there may be additional support. I understand it would be for those students, you know, zoned for that school, generally speaking. <laughs> Yes, Thank and, you. And, and Mr. Lowndes and his um, student services team, at, at some point, um, we will request some time to give you an update on our telehealth and expansion of behavioral health this year, um, which is a whole different presentation, which we're not, but we will come back with that. Ms. Creamer. Thank you again, Dr. McKinnon, for this information. This is really great, I think, you know, for our benefit and for the benefit of the public so really do appreciate you doing this um, I have a question about the non-public placements sure. so can you talk a little bit about what that entails and why it would be necessary or some scenarios that it would be necessary to place a student in a non-public placement and kind of how a little bit of how, about how that process works sure there are two different kind of scenarios that I would want to share with you first of all to, to lay a foundation 
non-public schools are all schools that are approved by MSDE, and they're part of the Maryland National Special Education Facilities, MANSEF. Those are the schools to which we can send students, to apply to send students. The schools, because they're non-public, which is important, can choose who they want to take. And it's usually based on disability category first. So they can say, we're only taking students who have this disability category. And that's something that doesn't lead, any, lead many places in the public school system, but in non-public, it weighs very heavily. So sometimes when parents go through that eligibility process, they're looking for a specific thing because of the end that they have in mind for their child. So there are two different scenarios. One is a student gets to non-public if we have failed to meet our mandate to support the student in showing progress. So this would be a student who is having difficulty with a skill, let's say it is reading. And over the years, despite the efforts that the school has put in, the interventions, the supports, the schedule, the student isn't making progress, then the, the school system determines that we're not able to meet the student's needs because no progress is being shown. So those students we may refer to a non-public who um, can have reading four hours a day. That's not something that's available in the public school system. So they may need to go somewhere like that to make progress. Another scenario is a student who, and this is most of our students who are in non-public placements, a student whose dysregulated behavior is not able to be managed. Um, most of the students that we have placed in non-public have significant self-injurious behaviors or significant aggressive behaviors due to deficits in communicative competence. So they're either you know, lashing out and hurting adults and other students, or they're hurting themselves to the point where um, we're, we are not able to manage them. We don't have the expertise, the structure, the infrastructure to support the students. Then we refer them to several non-public placements and they go through an interview process and um, are accepted somewhere and we manage the case by managing case managing for the student and um, we bear the financial burden. And I'm glad you asked that question because it, you know, at this time during COVID, we had quite a few of these non-publics close. Um, and so there's less available seats and expertise in some of these areas that are out there now. And so many more school districts, including ourselves, are, have students that have been identified for non-public, but we're not able to find a, a spot right now because there's just not a spot available or open. And so we have to find a way to still educate them in Charles County Public Schools while we wait for a spot to open up. And I think sometimes you might hear from a school about a student that, that they feel is maybe not should be appropriately placed within their building or something, but that's why, you know, if you'd asked us, because sometimes what we are doing is working on another, an alternative placement, but during that time period, legally, we have to have, provide an education for those students. And so. Just a quick follow-up to that. Um, is this decision um, usually a mutual decision between the family and the school, or is this something that the parent has to consent to, or? For how? non-public? Yes. It's, it's, a mutual decision and it is unusual that a family does not see the need um, for this extra layer and what we have sometimes is the distance piece because they don't want the student to have to go to Baltimore or go to you know other play other states Virginia for um, for services so they're concerned about that and that's something we have to navigate and really train the drivers of those routes and things of those natures, because the students spend a lot of time on the buses because we're a non-public desert here in Southern Maryland. Thank you for that. That was very helpful. Uh, Ms. Smith. I don't know why I looked at Ms. Thomas like, my name is Ms. Smith. Um, <laughs> uh, Mr. Lounge, you mentioned COVID. Uh, I was just curious, have we seen an uptick in identification of students for special education services, especially like our young children who because of the pandemic were unable to be with their peers or for whatever reason, they now have like speech and language impairments um, or delays. Are we seeing an uptick in the number of those students or? We have seen an uptick in people wanting to get, receive special education services. And I think the one thing that, that 
the public needs to understand is that, you know, just because you're struggling might not mean you qualify for special education. Right. Um, and so there's a, there's a process that schools have to do legally to show that they're trying supports and interventions prior to going to special education. And I think that sometimes people get frustrated because that, that process means providing a, an intervention or some type of support and help and to see whether the student re, uh, reacts in a favorable way um, and is actually improving in whatever area that they are getting the help and support in. And if they are getting the help, they are improving, then they probably will not qualify for special education because it's really not a disability that's preventing that student from learning. It, it's some other thing uh, for whatever reason, they just needed more help, more support, but they've shown that they're able to, to improve by getting that additional help and additional support um, going forward. And so, you know, the, the, you have to have a, a, a disability that has an educational impact mm -hmm. in order to receive special education services. And I guess I was thinking, my mind immediately went to some, some of our youngest learners, so thinking about some of the pre-K centers that we just opened. Um, and sort of making more space in some of our uh, K through 12 centers, not K through 12, uh, elementary schools for these pre-K centers and noting that some of these students may be identified for special education services. So I was just curious if we were seeing an uptick in those numbers, especially given that they are so young and they are just coming into our system. Do you see, go ahead, do you see an increase in it? Yes, we do see an increase and it's really hitting our um, child find and infants and toddlers mm -hmm. area right now. Um, we're in the midst of renegotiating some things with Department of Health and Human Services around that so we can make sure we get to families who have asked for support. Um, and a lot of the children who are just turning three or when you're coming to the schools were children who were conceived during that time. Mm -hmm. And so it was just a different world. And, and, and for us in special education leadership and education leadership in general, um, we have to recalibrate our thinking for what is typical, what is you know, the, the norm, because it's different than it was, you know, mm -hmm. a few years ago. The students that we get, it's, it's typical that maybe you react to some things, maybe you like to be more alone, you're less social, you don't go outside as much, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It is always, you know, the earlier we can catch a student um, and start services, the better. Thank you. Ms. Thomas, and then we have to finish up. Okay, um, quick question. How many have we got out in the community on their own so far? Um, can you? Like in the housing, where they can kind of like be on their own but still have some guidance where they come out and the teachers go with them with their working? Oh, we, for community-based instruction, all of our Achieve students and our adult students do that. All of them? Yes, oh, all okay. of them have community-based instruction as part of their IEP because they have those functional life skills needs. So at some level, they're accessing the school to work um, learning. Okay, and so um, have any of them kind of like graduated on, like on their own? Oh, yes, yeah. I don't know, I don't have a concrete don't number. Have a okay. I can get it for you though because we do have to keep track of that for MSDE. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good, thanks. Thank you so much. We're gonna take a quick break and um, let's try to come back in five or six minutes. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and read the rules for public forum. Speakers should identify themselves. Statements should be brief to the point and limited to three minutes or less. Board members should not be expected to respond during the forum to statements made by speakers. When appropriate, CCPS staff may address the speaker's concerns directly. Statements should relate to Charles County Board of Education agenda items or any education-related topic with the following limitations. Personnel matters, pending or potential appeals or comments regarding the actions or statements of individual staff or the private lives of any individual are not appropriate topics. Proper language and decorum are required at all time. This evening, we have one speaker signed up for a public forum. I'm gonna call him up, Mr. Sondheimer. Did I pronounce that correctly? Okay, you can come on up. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening. My name is Robert Sondheimer. I was a former teacher in Charles County 
for 30 years. And uh, I, I'm sorry, I just found out about this particular issue from a friend of mine uh, just, just the other day, so I might not have complete information on it. Um, and maybe I can get the policy, proposed policy by the Board of Ed. But I did have a concern about changing the dress code for uh, students and making it more informal. Um, as you know and I know from following schools, even after I retired, you know, the problems in the schools are greater than they used to be when I, when I taught. Um, and I just am afraid that making the dress code more lax and will encourage uh, it not education. I want education to be in a setting that it seems real serious. And I'm just afraid that a, a more lax dress code will enforce the feeling that it's not serious among a lot of kids that have trouble already. So that is my main comment. I hope that you reconsider the dress code. And uh, uh, I have my email. If, if you have a copy of the proposed dress code, I'd like to see it. Or you can email it to me. Uh, and I'll try to get formal comments to you. Uh, about it, but I just, in general, would hate to see uh, the dress code become more informal. I just don't think that's the proper situation for school. Okay. 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 Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. If you want to leave your email with uh, Miss Miss Mackey has it, uh, we can send you. Um, we'll send you a link to the presentation that that explains what the dress code is, and if you have any other comments, you can respond back as well. Okay. Right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. That was our only speaker for this evening. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much, Ms. Mackey. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from Mr. Heim. Good evening, everyone. This evening, I'm joined by Tom Gregan, who is our supervisor of maintenance. You may recall that Tom joined the CCPS team near the end of last school year. So this is his first time presenting the comprehensive maintenance plan. I did make a deal with him that no tough questions will be directed to Tom. All the tough questions will be directed to, to me. Uh, so if we could please uh, hold through on that promise that I made to Tom. Our CMP Comprehensive Maintenance Plan is one of several documents that is required that we submit and every LEA submit to the state in support of our annual CIP Capital Improvements Program. Uh, so this evening, Tom will be going over that document. Just a couple things to keep in mind when we talk about the maintenance of our facilities. We maintain 39 facilities in Charles County Public Schools in terms of school settings, 22 elementary schools, 8 middle schools, 7 high schools, and 2 centers which comprises over 4.2 million square feet of space that our operations staff and maintenance staff uh, take care of on a yearly basis. In terms of that 4.2 million square feet, that's the tenth largest amount of our total square footage in the state amongst the LEAs. It also uh, includes 261 relocatable classrooms that we have throughout those various 39 facilities. And the average adjusted age of our facilities is 29.2 six years. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Mr. Gregan to talk the specifics of the comprehensive maintenance plan. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Good evening sir. The comprehensive maintenance plan is the framework on how our maintenance department operates. Um, they give us the, I'm going to read it word for word to begin with. The CMP acts as a living document that's presented to the Board of Education. Each year is a reported item and once it's approved, it's an action item. It is then submitted to the state of Maryland Interagency Commission on School Construction. Um, basically, it's a group of uh, numbers attained based upon our workload, the work orders that are presented to us from the schools, also preventive maintenance schedules that we produce ourselves in-house and put it into our maintenance uh, system. Uh, we'll go on to the next page. 
the, uh, the introduction A and supporting documentation. Uh, it's basically the purpose, the principles, the vision, and the mission of what, what they're trying to uh, get from us to compare to the other uh, school systems within the state. Um, the facility outcomes B, uh, it evaluates the metrics of how our maintenance program is operating compared to industry standards. These standards are given to us by the IAC. Um, the metrics that we use are given to us from them in order to obtain these standards. Um, some of these standards are, uh, I wouldn't want to say questionable, but some of the standards I've kind of questioned to a certain extent. Um, and then resources and inputs. Um, that would be our maintenance staff, our operating staff, and the quantities of which we work with the uh, through enabled through our budget. <coughs> um, D, planned actions. Those would be any changes that we make from year to year, any improvements to the maintenance plan, whether it's from in-house or from the IAC recommendations based on these reports. Um, the list, we also list our capital projects to the state for the upcoming school year, the 24 school year. Um, these, these plans sometimes do not happen because of budget. Sometimes they do. Um, sometimes they get moved back because of uh, planning issues or construction issues. Obstacles and missing resources. Um, primarily the biggest item that I've seen since I've been with the school system, which is a very short period of time, and it's also in, in all industry is the, the price or the inflation of products and materials and also being able to get those products and materials in a timely fashion. Um, we also have some staffing and, and budget constraints that we have to work with uh, in order to try to get these, these items and these uh, projects taken care of. On the comprehensive maintenance plan, maintenance plan they've asked for, they give us a, a script of items to supply to them in order to uh, put this together. Um, one of the things that they don't really mention that I'd like to convey is that you know, there are several different types of maintenance. Um, there's preventative maintenance, there's corrective maintenance, and then there's capital maintenance. The preventative maintenance are the items that we take care of on our own, things that we know that need to be done, filter changes, belt changes, uh, any, anything that has a wear uh, longevity is what we're looking at. Um, the corrective maintenance are the items that we get the calls on every day. Uh, something's making a noise, something's not working, uh, lights are out. Those are the things that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis that we have to react to. The capital maintenance, those are the items or the things that we see that aren't an issue right this minute, but things that we need to keep in our, in our, in our site that need to be taken care of in the future before we become one of the other, before we become reactive. We, uh, we look at that, we have a list of those items compiled every year, and we usually, you know, based on what the workload brings us throughout the year, we sometimes have the funding to, to address some of these aspects as we can. So, on to the, what's scripted up here, preventive maintenance, PM work orders. Last year, uh, the preventive maintenance work orders were, that were open was 2,792, that is, up by 289 work orders based upon the year before. Um, these work orders were addressed and remedied and closed within 30 days, which was 80, 82%. That number has increased. We are more efficient this year than we were the previous year, where we were only at 75% in that same duration of time. Our hours, staff hours, has increased we are, this past, season, past year, we were at 15,652 hours. It increased by 1,619 hours. Um, 
our dollar spent have increased also. I'm not going to get into the dollar, each dollar figure, but they have increased substantially. And the uh, percentage of all maintenance work orders spent on preventative maintenance has remained the same at 22%. So the important thing to see there is that most of the preventative maintenance is done by our staff for very little, uh, you know, around 10% <coughs> is done by outside contractors. So we try to address as many of those issues as we can with in-house staff. On the corrective maintenance side, these work orders, these are the work orders that are generated from the building service managers, from the principals, and from my staff from within on things or subjects, items that we see that need to be addressed or repaired. Um, this past year, we opened, or there were 17,915 work orders opened. That increased by 1,048 from the previous year. The work orders closed within 30, 30 days was 92%. That also, uh, we also became more efficient in that from 91 percent the prior year. Um, something we tried to educate the folks that were initiating the work orders. Uh, the year previous year before our work orders marked as emergency or high priority were 7.5 percent. This past year between education and being on top of some of these issues before they became emergencies dropped dramatically down to 2.8 percent. Um, our staff hours have increased uh, this past year. We were 53,986. The previous year, we inc we've increased beyond the previous year by 5,230 hours. Uh, the contractor hours spent on corrective maintenance, we don't currently measure that. Uh, it's not, uh, the ability of that is not currently in the maintenance system that we have. This is something that's on our future radar that we were going to be looking at upgrading this, this, our maintenance system. I'll say ERP, you take care of that and don't say anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll tie it all together. <laughs> um, the dollar figures, you know, they are as they are. There's not much we can, we can do with those at this point in time. All, all, all we can do is to try to offset these things, these items as we move throughout this new school year. Um, the amount of work orders entered by non-building level staff was 37 percent. That means teachers um, and other educators and folks within the system. The uh, work orders entered by building level staff was 63 percent. These numbers um, have changed a bit from last year, but I think they also were inverted. I think they were incorrectly posted last year. So we have that uh, straightened out. In total, uh, we had a total of 20,707 work orders that we uh, addressed in the past school year. Now, I will say, because I pointed out with the preventative the maintenance, you'll see with the corrective maintenance, there is a higher percentage of work completed by outside contractors. And that's because you're going to be talking about larger ticket items. So if we have to replace a fire panel, as part of the fire alarm system at a school, that's something that's going to be beyond our staff. So we'll have a contractor come in and do that. As we know, we have a number of our schools that are on uh, their own private well. So if we <coughs> replace a pump for that well, we're going to bring in an outside contractor. Some of those wells are 400 feet deep. So in order to pull that pump and replace that, uh, that pump, we'll have a contractor come in and do that. Uh, if we have to you know, replace a chiller or cooling tower, something as unplanned, again, that's something that's going to be on the the scope of our work so again we'd be bringing in an outside contractor for some of those larger ticket items so just kind of explains the difference between percentages of in-house with preventative maintenance versus in-house with corrective actions noted items within this year's CMP continued the summary of staffing against industry standards the metrics and metrics that they've given us if you if you start comparing numbers based upon the actual listed jobs within the CMP versus what you're seeing here, some of this is, is a bit different based upon the directive that we've been given by the IAC. We're listing in, in the, the, the uh, CMP the actual 
quantities and job titles of all associated with maintenance. In some of these standards, they're only asking for the feet on the ground, the people that with the, with the tools in their hands, not necessarily the administrators. So if you see some of these, these numbers differentiate, it's because that's the way they have asked us to prepare this. Um, in this that you see, the 4,531,400 square feet is the quantity of square footage that we maintain within Charles County Board of Education. They're telling us based upon the stewardship standards that we were given for every, for 4,531,400 square feet, there should be 67 maintenance workers to maintain those, that many, that square footage. Um, as you can see the previous year, we were budgeted for 64. At the end of this past year, we were actually only at 60. Uh, the current budget is at, at 66. We are trying to uh, replace or fill some of the vacancies, but just like in every business and everything out here, it's very hard to find workers these days. Um, you can see that uh, the maintenance staff, the percentages are, uh, they're only stating that the 84% for our actual, that's based upon how many feet are on the ground based upon the numbers that they've given us to work with. Any questions? One other thing I would like like to add just briefly uh, is I talk about this a lot with the collaboration. So, you know, the folks that Tom supervises on a daily basis, our maintenance staff, they're not assigned to buildings, so they're out as part of preventive maintenance taking care of issues, and they're out for corrective actions taking care of, of maintenance-related issues. So we really rely on our building service staff who are assigned to those schools. So. The, you know, the collaboration between Tom and April Murphy, who's our supervisor of operations, to make sure that that building service manager, when they come in in the morning to open up the building and do their building walkthrough, to be checking on, you know, going through the mechanical rooms and, and checking on these systems, as Tom talked about, the noises or looking for leaks. Uh, and the same thing with collaboration with our planning construction office. So, you know, as I mentioned, some of these large ticket items replacing a chiller or cooling tower. We need to be looking at the life uh, cycles of those and uh, talk about, you know, future planning with them and working with uh, the, the office led by Steve Andrews, the plan of construction, because it is Steve's office who submits those CIP requests to the state. So there needs to be a, a great deal, and there is a great deal of cooperation and collaboration between those two offices to make sure that we are, you know, in our five-year CIP, we're putting on boilers that need to be replaced and chillers that need to be replaced or roof replacement. So there's a lot of collaboration and meetings that take place behind the scenes between those three people, Tom, April, and Steve, to make sure that we are taking care of our, our facilities. I appreciate that. Thank you. Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Heim <clears throat> and Mr. Gregan as well uh, for your first presentation to the board. You did a fine job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is more so around the, the last comment you made in terms of it's difficult to find workers. And Mr. Heim, I'm going to direct this to Mr. Gregan. I don't think it's a difficult question. You can but handle it. Jump in if you, you need to. <laughs> yeah. uh, you mentioned the difficulty in finding workers, which we've heard across a number of industries. Yes. But given the, the breadth of programs that Charles County has for our CTE students, is there an opportunity to partner with some of our CTE programs and offer apprenticeships or kind of intern to hire programs where we can, we're growing our own, but being able to tap into those industries to kind of bring them into the, the world in which you spoke about? It is in some aspects. Some, most of the aspects or most of the positions that we're looking for, we're looking for tenured workers, people who have or bring a skill set to the table initially. We do have some lesser skill set uh, positions mm -hmm. which are part of this um, apprenticeships you know the, the apprenticeship part of it aspect or the CTE program we've had some discussions about and trying to trying to figure out a way to make that work in with what we have going on but unfortunately right now we need to focus on some sk the skilled laborers is really what we're we're trying to trying to get so we can maintain the level of maintenance that we need to do with these buildings Understood. But we, we have met a couple of times, and most recently we met last week with, uh, with Tom, and I mentioned April Murphy, our supervisor of operations, uh, and also had a conversation with Sandy Rooney and CTE. So we are looking at, uh, and we did, we did that about a year or so ago, uh, but we're again looking at some opportunities and working with them to see if there are some opportunities we can provide for some of our students. Great. Thank you. Um, I had a question. Yes, sir. On the 
Corrective maintenance, so 63% entered by building staff and 37% by non-building staff. So who, who would the non-building staff would be? Like people from, from your shop that come out and do periodic checks of the school? Non-building staff may be uh, principals, uh, principal secretaries. Um, I, I don't want to consider myself, but myself, Mike. I enter some, they love it when I enter work orders. Um, okay, so building level staff. So I guess I guess I would consider a principal a building level staff, but that's Tip, not. Yeah. So typically, most work orders are submitted by building service. Uh, so when they're referring to non-building staff, it's okay. just outside of, of those two careers. But yeah, so our principals can also enter work orders. So that would be included in that smaller percentage of folks that enter work orders. Okay, and so that process. So like, if a teacher sees something. Like they can physically go. A, a teacher cannot enter or submit work orders. Uh, okay. What they are instructed to do is they should uh, submit that to administration or to the building service staff so they can be submitted. Okay. But it's submitted based upon the person who has initiated the call. So it would not be, in, you know, it would be submitted and listed as the principal or whomever had said, hey, this, this needs to be addressed. We need to create a work order and submit this to maintenance. Okay. Uh, I follow that. Thanks. Yeah, please. Um, so, you know, welcome. Thank you very um, much. It's been great to, to have you here. Um, you know, I have to tell you, I used to watch the presentations from my former district on this. I don't know why. Um, I was at the time the chief academic officer, but this always interested me around the, um, the how quickly we close work orders. Um, and it is very, um, it is a very good percentage compared to my previous district, especially on corrective um, maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, corrective maintenance, maintenance sometimes is much more intricate of an issue than preventative maintenance, although we want to do as much preventative as possible. I'm curious, as you come next year to do the presentation, if you, if you have data in comparison to other jurisdictions, I just think it's a pretty impressive number. Even the preventative maintenance going up to 82% from, I think you said 70 something percent from the previous year. Mm -hmm. This is an important piece around proactiveness of our staff in our schools. Um, and so I just wanna commend the team on this because this is, um, these are very good numbers for us. And, I'm, and I think the board, would probably, um, it would expand if we were able to see how this looks in other jurisdictions. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I don't know that I can get those, but I will definitely reach out to the IAC and see if they will uh, share some of those uh, some of those numbers with us. Yeah, because um, we, we give it to them, right? Yes. We have to report them. So yeah, so it's called Information Act. So um, mm -hmm. it is public information. It's just a matter of that nobody asks, but um, having sat through board meetings in other jurisdictions, I can tell you that our numbers are pretty impressive. Thank you. There, there are some documents that they send to us. Uh, Mike and I were going over a document that was sent down. It's the actual assessment fiscal year for 2023 that they pass out. It shows all of the counties and how, how we uh, rank amongst each other or amongst these, uh, the rubrics that were uh, explained. And Mike, if you want to. I will. And we just received that report on Friday. So for this week's weekly update to the board, uh, I will include that, but it's a facilities assessment. Uh, so what it does, it gives us a score. Uh, again, we don't particularly like the rubric that uh, they changed to back in FY21, where again, and I'll put that you know, disclaimer out there, schools who got good uh, assessments uh, you know, in that range now get in the adequate, and that's based upon the, the new rubric. Uh, so for this, uh, FY23 this past school year, the state average was 70.57, which is adequate. Uh, and Charles County had five schools that were inspected and our average was 71.35. So we were above the, the state average. Uh, and none of the schools systems, uh, the 24 school systems were in that good or superior uh, category. And there were actually only of the 1200 schools that were inspected last year around the state, there were only five schools uh, that fell into that good or superior category out of 1,200 schools. So you can see how much that rubric and, the, and that has changed since FY21. Uh, and there were seven or eight school systems that were in that non, uh, not adequate uh, rating. So I will include that in the weekly board update uh, to the board this week. And you can, and I'll also include the entire document. It's a 192-page document. So if you 
get bored on a Saturday or Sunday night. Uh, you can actually go and look at, you know, as Dr. Navarro asked about looking at the work order completion for school systems. You wouldn't see this in that report, but you can actually see every single inspection that was done at all the 24 LEAs, those 1,200 schools that I mentioned, and you can, you know, use that as a comparison uh, us against the other school systems in, in the state of Maryland. But we were, we're not happy to be any adequate, but that is kind of, that's, you know, the standard that this, the state is pushing now. Uh, but again, we were above the, the state average. I agree completely with Mike about the word adequate. It, it doesn't, it just doesn't roll off your tongue well. It doesn't make you sit well or me sit well. Um, we have some, uh, the maintenance efficiency assessments that will be kicking off on the 3rd of October, one of four for this coming year. And we had a kickoff meeting back in August to initiate and uh, get to know the folks that are gonna be doing the inspections. And I explained this to Mike that one of the first comments, the gentleman that's initiating the, uh, the meeting mentioned that, you know, oh, you guys were at 71.5%. You're, you're right where we want you. Mm, yeah. So, you know, that, that to me tells us that, you know, are we fighting an uphill battle to try to, to get to this, this you know, next uh, status. So, you know, we're still going to fight and try to do what we can with the budgets that we have to work with. Um, but, you know, this is, this is the, dealt, the, the hand that we're dealt with, and we have to work with it. Yeah, understood. Miss Morley, don't want to leave you out. Do you have any questions? Oh, thank you. I appreciate it, Ms. Lucas. Um, I'm sure we've probably touched on this subject before, but um, my question really is around the priorities and how those are determined. Can you explain a little bit um, for the benefit of the public, please? Priority number one for us is, is safety. Um, anything that's going to put someone in harm's way uh, for persons, Next would be the facility itself after that. Um, and then thirdly is going to be uh, what is it, what's it going to take, what's it going to affect long term or short, short term, and then uh, how, we, how we can address it monetarily, or funding to get it repaired or replaced, and is it something that is needed right at that moment, and then it drops back into our list of other items to be scheduled according to uh, need right. and another thing is we'll look at you know the replacement versus you know when we hate to use the word deferred maintenance uh, but you know what's the cost of taking care of that now or being able to push it a little bit down the road in terms of the operation of the school so if it's something that has that is a need but has minimal impact on the day-to-day -day operation of the school and when we look at our, our funding it's something that you know we're likely going to push down the road uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, we've had a number of conversations about over the last couple of weeks is a chiller at one of our schools. Uh, there are two chillers based upon the size of the school, and one is used for redundancy uh, for purposes of when we get past that typical cooling season, because there are still large events that are held at that school, we still can uh, operate that one smaller chiller, uh, you know, pretty much, you know, 24-7, 365 days a year. But as we look at having to potentially place one of those two chillers, you know, do we want to do that knowing that we're going to be replacing that second chiller a few years down the road? Or do we just look at going out and buying one larger chiller that's going to service that in that entire school? So, you know, again, it's not a corrective action we have to take right now, uh, but it's something, you know, when we weigh our, our current budget and where, where we are, is it something we need to do immediately? Uh, or is it something we can, you know, do next year or, or three years down the road? So when, you know, Mrs. Morley talks about priorities, uh, you know, things that, you know, they're going to disrupt the operation of the school, we're going to take care of those things as soon as we can. Whereas something, you know, one of the things, you know, that and we get dinged about in the state assessments is sometimes, you know, cracks in, in, in parking lots. Yes, that, you know, it's an, it's an eyesore to have cracks in the, in the parking lots, and in some cases it, it could become a, a safety hazard uh, depending upon how large the, or the extent of those cracks are in the parking lot. 
but in terms of the overall day-to-day -day operation of the school, it's something that's likely going to be put as deferred maintenance to compared to replacing something that you know affects heating and cooling in the building or you know a fire alarms that impact the you know the light safety systems in the schools or obviously you know replacing lights or out in those things. So, you know, I'll be honest with you, our our needs are greater than our budget. So that's where you know these decisions have to come in. Talking about the the safety aspect, the security aspect, and the effect it has on a day to day operation of the school when making decisions on what to prioritize. And, uh, and unfortunately, sometimes we have to make these decisions um, because of time, uh, supply chain uh, materials. Uh, this chiller that Mike's speaking of, uh, if we were to order it tomorrow, we're looking at 45 to 50 weeks to take delivery. So, you know, these, these are the things that also have to play uh, tremendously in, in what we're doing and how we're doing. Well, appreciate the update, and, and, and as always, I think anyone that walks around our schools, and we've heard this repeatedly from people that come down from the state, they're, they're always very complimentary at the state of our schools um, from, from every aspect, just the, the, the cleanliness and, you know, a, a 50, 60-year-old school, uh, you, you thought it would have been built in the last five or ten years. It, it just it looks so spotless inside. So Appreciate um, that. Thank you. Appreciate all the... The, the hard work you guys do. Is there anything else? Any other questions? All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. You. Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Gill and Miss Mackey. Is that right? Good evening. We come to you this evening to talk again about the 24-25 school year calendar. So you, I'm sure, remember that on June 26th you approved the 24-25 school year calendar. Um, since that time, through the summer, we have um, heard from a lot of parents and from a lot of staff concerned about uh, the school year starting a week earlier than is typical, um, but with the embedded days off to provide long weekends, uh, the, the end date in June, uh, in June 2025, would still be very typical. So I think the uh, general consensus that we heard feedback was um, if we're starting earlier, we should get out earlier. If we're not going to get out earlier, we should start later. Uh, there was concern about summer being cut short, you know, vacation times in August being cut short and time with families. Um, however, since June 26th, uh, we had um, the chiefs have been sitting down with their departments talking about all that summer work. I want to refresh your memory about two weeks ago, the chiefs came in front of you and talked about all of the uh, maintenance that Mr. Gregan just talked about, the preventive maintenance that happens in the summer, all of the construction projects, Human Resources uh, does a lot of onboarding, they're recruiting teachers, they're still getting everybody in place. Um, teaching and learning was uh, uh, works full time, full speed ahead during the summer with summer school and summer boost and trying to turn around um, a well thought out summer school program and summer boost programs and then getting staff, uh, students in the correct courses at the end of summer school is a challenge. And so as we have sat through the summer and tried to plan out all that work, what it will look like next summer, uh, since we would be starting the year a little bit earlier, all of the chiefs and their offices uh, agreed that they would all benefit from a little extra time in the summer to start the school year in good shape. Um, I wouldn't say it was the tipping point, but again, to refresh your memory, the weekend before school started, when we were still trying to finish up construction projects at all of our schools, that was a little bit of a dodgy situation. And so uh, that might have been the frosting on the cake that said we really need every second that we can possibly squeeze into the summer. 
So we come to you tonight to ask that you consider revising the 24-25 calendar that you've approved to a more typical start date, um, starting teachers reporting to work on August 19th instead of August 12th, which is what's been approved. Uh, the first day for students being August 26th instead of August 19th. Um, there would, ha we've kind of zhuzhed, adjust, adjusted. Uh, Shelly's talent has adjusted some of the days within the school year. Fair day is the same as the approved calendar. Um, we, I do think, uh, would reopen on January 2nd instead of having two additional days um, at winter break. And the last day for students would be June 10th and the last day for teachers would be June 11th with the proposed calendar that is in board docs. And this information in the PowerPoint is in board docs in a Word document. We just put it on slides to give you a visual sure. representation as opposed to putting a singular document up. Um, but what we did to make this model, um, to make up for those five days that we are proposing to pull and shift yeah. is um, there was, we had a two week winter break. Um, so winter break for 24, 25 now looks like this current calendar year um, with students coming back the day after um, New, Year's. New Year's Day, so January 2nd. In February, and I don't have a slide here, um, but we had built in an extra day off for students and teachers in February in connection with President's Day. So as opposed to having a three-day weekend, we had a four-day weekend. Um, we had initially closed students for, and for teachers on February 14th, um, but we, do, we still have that three-day weekend in February. Um, we left the three-day weekend that we had built into the calendar in March alone because that's a long time period with a break before spring break. So we heard that from the calendar survey data. So we did not touch that day. Um, we did in April build in a, an additional student closure day at the end of spring break, which we had never done before. We had never built that into a calendar model. So we did remove that date as a student makeup date. Um, and the end of the school year shifts back for students and teachers just by one day. So when you take away those five days, if we were to open um, consistent with how we did the school year, you have to make that time up for, for the 180 day rule, um, which is reflected here. The last day for students shifts ahead just by one day um, for students and same for teachers. Any questions? Questions, I'm sure. Uh, we'll do Ms. Creamer and then Ms. Smith. I do want to get student opinion on this. Okay. 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 okay, so quick yes. question. Yeah. Would we be going back before Labor Day or after Labor Day with this? No. So the approved before. calendar that's in place, that's outlined in the current parent handbook calendar, mm -hmm. which is where I think a lot of the feedback that we were seeing online from parents is when that hard copy of the calendar came home the first week of school this year, you flip to August 2024, September 2024, or excuse me, 2025. Um, people were seeing those dates, but the current approved calendar that was approved by, approved by the board in June has us coming back before Labor Day. Okay. But I like this calendar. I think it kind of gives us like a little bit more breaks or like a little bit longer time the way that it's set up. So I like it. Okay. So Ms. Creamer and then Ms. Smith. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so not really a question more of a comment hybrid maybe comment question but um, so how did re we receive this feedback after the approval because I recall that we did a survey mm -hmm. and we discussed the survey results and I remember this was something we were discussing particularly Mr. Hancock and I were like kind of going back and forth like it was hard to and then as a board we, we were having a difficult time coming up with what um, what was what were the responses on the survey in terms of wanting longer breaks but you know wanting to start later and we couldn't really make the all of those happen and so just curious one 
how are how did we receive additional feedback once the survey closed so let's start with that so I was surveying groups online just mm -hmm. seeing comments from parents and a lot of the groups that I'm in mm -hmm. but also too um, we heard a lot of internal feedback from staff trying to figure out how this model would work with planning for next year um, we didn't send a formal survey out to say, hey, mm -hmm. staff are going to propose a new option um, mm -hmm. at the, the board meeting today. But we did send something out last week to say, hey, the calendar is back on the board agenda for the work session. If you have any feedback, please join us at the meeting. Um, I didn't see any comments come through, but I did see a lot of discussion online. I personally didn't get any emails from parents, but I did see some conversations about um, from both parents and staff mm -hmm. indicating you know, their concerns over it. I think we could survey if that was the will of the board again. for the No, no, I wasn't year. asking that. I was just right. curious because this is just one of the challenges that we have as a school system, right, is that we send out a survey right. timely mm -hmm. and we didn't get that many responses back. I think in terms of, I guess, historically how many we received back, I think it was right. a good number. Mm -hmm. But in terms of how many students we have, it, you know, in staff, I think the number was considerably low because I think we we're around 3,000 or something if I recall correctly right yeah or even less so mm -hmm. I just just I'm just concerned about going forward if that if we put out a survey and we receive the responses and we you know this was a lot of deliberation went into this mm -hmm. you know um, and so I'm not challenging like the decision today you know or your recommendation today personally I'm just saying that um, this is why it's really important for you know, families, staff, everyone to be engaged and make sure that we, um, you know, answer the opportunities to engage and, and give feedback um, because I don't want us to have to do this. I don't want this to be a habitual thing to have mm -hmm. to come back and do this. And um, that was one of the challenges I remember is like, well, they want longer breaks, mm -hmm. but a later start time, but then they don't want to be into school till the end of June. And you just have to understand, everyone has to understand we can't make all of those things happen, right? right. So it's mm -hmm. just kind of, we, we deliberated over this numerous times in numerous right. meetings. Um, so I don't know, maybe being more, I, I know you guys have done a lot of work around engaging the community and staff but maybe just you know going back to the drawing board on that on thinking about how we can engage more at the time you know that it's relevant right. because i really don't think it's best practice to come back after it's been approved to say we need to make these adjustments um and my other comment would just be that if you know an earlier start time just doesn't work for anyone including staff which all these reasons are you know very valid then we just probably shouldn't even look at options in the future that are that early um, you know we should probably just stick to the August 26th start date you know what I mean and I guess we could adjust you know in the middle but I just don't think you know if there was that much pushback and particularly among staff and a lot of preparation that we need to do as a school system over the summer and that week is really critical then we probably just shouldn't even look at options like that and that's just my opinion so um, those are my comments, but thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just weigh in on that. I'm sorry. So, I, I, you know, I have to say that um, I will take ownership on a misstep from staff to critically take a look at this um, because I think one of the things that we need to make sure is that we feel confident enough that we've had enough of a summer where we can have, first of all, administrators ha be able to take time off um, and feel like the school's not years not starting already. Uh, and I think uh, one takeaway that I take from this process is that there's got to be some level of non-negotiable, unless we're going to change other infrastructures in the schools, where, to your point, we sort of say this is the earliest we could possibly go. Okay. And I think we went a little bit um, too aggressively under that. and. Um, Frankly, I think there was a lot of not just parents. I think parents sometimes wake up. A lot of our parents woke up to like next year. Now they're thinking about next year. Some of our most vocal ones um, are with us from two years, but a lot of parents are waking up to that. But also, us operationally just um, being able to to sort of put a, 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 a we can't come back from this with all the construction and all the things happening. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely makes sense. I just I know it's probably the first time we've ever we ever had, um, I think that I can recall, a proposal to return that early. Um, 
but obviously it's a learning you know, a learning process. And so just want to make sure, you know, that we try to avoid that in the future. And if that is, you know, the general consensus, particularly for operations, to Dr. Navarro's point, then we just, we just can't look at options mm -hmm. like that. So we have to work within the parameters that, you know, are set and that work for a, the school system and then, you know, for families alike. Ms. Smith. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so Ms. Kramer took the, the first part of my question, which was helpful, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, definitely appreciated that we put the survey out to families and I know that several of us sort of pushed to ensure that the community was engaged mm -hmm. and Dr. Navarro I do hear your point that there are some families that are thinking two years out mm -hmm. um, but most families do wake up within the current school year thinking about next school year mm -hmm. and recognize that the window has passed for them to provide comment um, I too you know, we're sort of online and saw some of the comments, just a handful of parents that were trying to figure out how this is going to work um, but not a sort of huge number so I won't talk necessarily about like the parents and their sort of engagement at this point, mm -hmm. but more so, Dr. Navarro, what you were mentioning in terms of staff, from a continuous improvement standpoint, noting that this is not going to be the first calendar that we have to review in our tenure, just making sure that we are thinking about what staff need, because um, I know from the board perspective, I don't have visibility into that, none of us do. Mm -hmm. We only have visibility into sort of our constituents, our families, and sort of what they may need. Um, so just making sure that the two do in fact meet as we're thinking about future calendars. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hancock. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you for the uh, for the information item uh, that will be an action item. I just kind of want to tag on with um, some of my colleagues have said. Um, you know, we did deliberate and spent a lot of time um, working on the calendar, and I just. Um, Ms. Kramer, I want to agree with her. Um, I, I think the earlier start date probably shouldn't be an option. Um, it sounds like the biggest reason are for to have adequate time for the summer programs and to get the school repairs and constructions done. Um, you know, um, no matter what calendar we put out there, not everyone's going to love it. Um, there was a lot of people that really wanted those long winter breaks and mm -hmm. the spring breaks, and now those people are going to probably be upset. Um, so, yeah, for sure, we will. And. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, I think just uh, my personal opinion, um, maybe we should, at least uh, for the foreseeable future, my opinion is uh, bringing that early start date before is probably not a, not a great idea. But thank you. Yeah, I think, you good, Ms. Thomas? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, the earlier start date is problematic only because we didn't finish a week early because we built in the, all, all those days and, and all those things you talked about you know can't get accomplished or not as efficiently but I just want to make sure I heard you correctly for for the the day you took that that were taken away I guess in April and February mm -hmm. you heard from from what what drove that did you get that from teachers from from the administrators no so if we start back a week later there's five days that we're cutting from the 180 for students so we had to take a look at where we could pull those states back okay and one so you, option could be adding them on to the end of the year but right. we heard the contingent right. saying we don't want to go late into the summer okay so i just okay i Sorry. so i just want to make sure i heard you correctly so it's that re really was the only day that you could pull so you weren't going we so late go yeah, later in you can June. add anything on to the end of right. the school year because the students have to do the 180 days so we could yeah. cut from other places but I feel like in the last couple of years we've done surveys on maybe taking a day or two in November um, and the feedback is never is never really good so just yeah. trying to figure out what new elements were implemented that we could pull away from while sure. trying to keep some long breaks still in there. I, I mean, those days we, we did hear from folks and, and, you know, coming out of COVID that having mm -hmm. those kind of mental breaks just there mm -hmm. were, were something. But if, mm -hmm. you know, if that's not resonating as loudly, and then quite frankly, a lot of these things that we heard, um, it wasn't though there was overwhelming support right we had that's why we, we we originally have three options and we made a fourth option that that is is what we're discussing tonight so mm -hmm. it, it's you know it's not like there's a hard consensus for for any one of the uh the things that that we're discussing um but no uh, you answer my question you just th th those days were pulled 
just because those were the the only time that you could uh that that you could you could find them i got it miss morley i don't want to forget about you yes yes thank you um i agree with the sentiments of my colleagues i think that um this is you know unfortunately going to create some confusion um with with changing the dates especially those that are advanced planners um, I completely understand the rationale, however, and particularly want to be sensitive to those that have limited dates that they could take off, you know, particularly our staff or administrators. Um, I know that, you know, the summer is precious and <laughs> there are a lot of people that have to can't plan very, very carefully around when they can take off, you know, over the summer. So I definitely want to be sympathetic to that. But I think that Ms. Ms. Kramer is correct that going forward, it seems like we already have our parameters in place for what we can, you know, map out that would hopefully be um, amenable to most people and we can't go too early or go too late. So it seems just in theory that the calendar is going to look relatively similar um, going forward. I am pleased to see days off every month. I think that is very, very essential. Um, I think the students need those mental health days. I'd like to reiterate again my request and support that we consider some kind of asynchronous days. Um, you know, I'm going to die on that hill because I believe that people, teachers, students, <laughs> everyone needs them. Even if we just start off with once a quarter, people are uncomfortable. I understand the concerns for the younger students as you know, parent of younger students, but I think that it is something that we should consider. I also know that we had um, some concerns around our food and nutrition staff and them being off, um, especially for the full two weeks in, in the winter. So I'm hoping these two days um, that we would be back um, you know, that, that were different from the previous calendar. Hopefully that would be something that would benefit them as well. Mm -hmm. But that's all I had. Thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Hancock? Just one more real quick thing. Um, I believe that the, the calendar we passed um, before, it's already been distributed, correct? So it was on board docs. We didn't really put it out to the community as far as um, other than saying that the board had approved the calendar for next year. We included the start dates and the current parent handbook calendar because at the time when the board approved it, we were ramping up for the 23-24 school year and we did have some parents call to say, hey, when, are, when is my child starting school this year? There was a little bit of confusion um, noted at least at calls that I took because any calendar call that comes into the Starkey building comes to the communications office. So. We didn't widely put it out there, um, but it is referenced on our website, so we would have to do some updates there. Yeah. Um, but then we would really start to push it out on the community. Yeah, and you bring up the, the hand calendars in the handbook. That's mm -hmm. where I saw it at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, I mean, um, for instance, my wife and I just booked our August vacation mm -hmm. two weeks ago, and we <laughs> I would have changed it. I would have moved it up a week <laughs> if I knew we were going to do it. So, um, my point is it is out there to where people can visualize it and mm -hmm. people are making their summer plans on it mm -hmm. so if if we do do this um we may want to mm -hmm. really push it out there that it has been changed yeah. so absolutely that's, and that's it thank you i have one question yes yes okay so looking at the calendar how come for november 5th on election day how come only students are out and not it's like not a staff and student out for school so for the calendar for next year, that was a day that teachers would have to make up because we're switching them coming back from the five days um, went to, from spring break. Right. So the calendar that was approved, we did something really wild and different. We said the day back after spring break, students would stay home, okay. get another extra day of spring break. But the teachers would come in and they would get their plans done, get ready for fourth quarter, do um, have some staff development. Mm -hmm. Well, because we're not doing that, we said we're going to come back and everybody's going to come back. The teachers still need to work 190 days. So we had to find a place in the calendar where we would have them come work their 190th day. So we could add it to the end of the year, but that's not really a productive time mm -hmm. after the kids are done the year the school year is over now we're going to pay you to come back and do what do what right yeah. exactly so, so so that's a day that we want to we can that we can have teachers work we can do training where they can be tr do mm -hmm. training and then apply that into the classroom for the rest of the year um, our schools are used for election pl 
uh, polls, um, but historically in Charles County, the polls are open, the voters come into the cafeteria or the gym or the lobby and vote, and the teachers are working in their classrooms or are attending training at non-polling places or attending training virtually. Is that Ms. Morley? I'm gonna point to her. Um, or attending training virtually where uh, they're not at the schools, but they are in training, something that they can then apply to instruction for the rest of the year. Okay, I was just asking because like, I know it's important to vote or whatever, and I was wondering like, how come they weren't like out of school or whatever, so did they still get their time to vote? So I think most um, adults that work, they can go to the polling places that are open from, what time do they open? Six or seven in the morning mm -hmm. till 7 p.m. And then we have early voting that you can vote in the weeks or absentee voting. So I think most people can find a place, find a time to to vote. I, for many, time, many times in my career, I voted at my workplace because I lived, you know, I lived in the community and then I went to work and I voted before I went to my classroom. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ms. Perkins. Yeah, Ms. Smith. Uh, just briefly, because I know we need to move on. I, I recall in our initial discussion about the calendar that we didn't want to impede our teachers sort of civic duty. So I do recognize that Maryland as a state has offered a lot more time for early voting um, and teachers have opportunities. Are they in school for the full day or just a partial day? Because I know they're in training. Is it a full eight hours or is it like a partial day? No, they, they're getting paid for a full day of work. So they would be expected to work a full day. Now, if somebody wants to work the polls, they could take leave. No, certainly, certainly. Yeah. But just trying to find ways of not, us not putting any barriers in place for them to, to be able to vote. Polls or voting? To, to vote. To vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so could it be something where it ends up being like a half a day, as in like an early dismissal? So like we're there for a little bit of time, but then they have their time after that to vote, so we get out a little bit earlier? Well, students won't be there. Yeah. The, student, oh, well, yeah, the yeah, students the aren't there. Aren't there. But as far as the employees, mm -hmm. they're being paid taxpayer money to work a full day. So I think to say, we'll pay you for the full day, but you don't really have to work the full day is probably not mm -hmm. financially responsible. So but Smith, there are things could, like... Let, let's let the superintendent... So what I would say to this is, you know, we have a lot of ways in which we incentivize our staff to participate in certain things that happen during the work day. Um, a lot of it is around the flexibility of professional learning days. So when, when there's a PD day, it's not a sort of a typical day for, for staff. They're in their training. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're let out a little early. There's flexibility during the lunch hour. Um, again, we have polling places throughout uh, locally for folks to do that. So I think we, we work with what we want. We absolutely want our staff uh, to model their civic duty for the rest of the community, including our students, and so we work with that flexibility. Um, I have not heard of issues where staff said, you know, I was, I, I was prevented from flexing yeah. my time a little bit to be able to do my civic duty. Yeah. Point I, taken. I, I think I just wanted to uh, raise I that. Also okay. like to see that veterans day um, would still be a day off for everyone. I know that was, we had a lot of discussion around yeah. that, and that very important to us, so thank you. Now, I was just going to say that this isn't a hill that I'm willing to die on for this particular calendar, noting that we have to make this change. Uh, but for future calendars, I will continue to kind of press the issue of perhaps keeping election day open for staff to vote. And I believe 24, 25 is an election year for Maryland. When, when you say leave it open, what? Meaning that it wouldn't be a staff work day. Okay. I think, you know, the one thing I think we'll have to keep in mind that, is that Everyone that lives in the county, they're not very far from where they have to vote. And so to, to echo the, the, what the superintendent said, I've, I've never heard uh, of an issue of someone being able to vote, and that was even before early voting. So, I mean, your point's well taken, but okay. it's, um, it's, it's the polls open late and no place is more than a half hour drive. So that's... Um, that's one thing about not being that large. Any other questions? One, one more thing. Ms. Perkins? Um, I do like the fact that we're going back early before Labor Day instead of after Labor Day because even if we did go back after Labor Day and our breaks were cut short, 
most of the time, I know that most people, like, depending on, like, spring break, winter break, they leave a little bit before or a couple days before and get those extra days. So I do like that we go back earlier and we get out earlier instead of going back later and getting out later in June. So I just want to put that out there. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, this will come up as an action item later in the agenda tonight. Uh, next, we have a couple uh, of updates. And uh, so, uh, Ms. Morley and myself, this is the, the board handbook Ms. Smith obtained. Uh, this is from the was this from NSBA or yes, yeah so this is one of the one of the school systems so this is something that we've talked about um, uh, a board handbook that just kind of outlines our standard operating procedures and so we had two subgroups uh, go through this and make some comments and some edits and uh, Miss Morley was one in one group and I was in another and she and I met last week and um, the, the edits are there in, in pen and ink, and um, I'll type them up and have it ready for the meeting next month. Ms. Morley, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, so just to thank uh, Ms. Smith, um, that was an excellent draft to work from. And um, we didn't have a lot of substantive changes. A lot of it, of course, was just tweaking it to our own um, school system, you know, mission goals, et cetera. But that was a solid start, so we appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Sure. Anytime. Yep, so that'll that'll be, uh, and, and again, it's not something that, that we have to, to, to finish immediately. I think having something that we can talk to for our board retreat will be a good thing, and I think we'll be in great shape to do that. Uh, next, uh, town halls. So, um, we have a town hall coming up, and I'll pause so the superintendent can tell me when that is. Our first town hall is, I quickly pulled it up, um, November 7th. Yeah. Miss um, Mackey, could you come back up, please? I'm sorry. It is um, November 7th from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. We don't have the confirmed location yet. So that's one of two things that we need to discuss. Uh, we need to discuss where and we need to discuss what. Uh, so um, last time Ms. Mackey told us when we talked about this a little bit, um, here is the best venue to, to have live video. Um, at other places, the, the setup is not as easy and also not as reliable but other venues offer more seating. That, that's kind of the trade-off. So the other thing we need to discuss is, as a topic, uh, just something that, that's maybe 15 or 20 minutes that the superintendent or someone from the staff will, will give a presentation on, and that'll, that'll set the theme for the night, but, but anything, people can come out and talk about anything, but uh, that's what we did the last time. So. Um, with that, if you'd like to ask Ms. Mackey any questions or if anyone has a, a comment about where um, they think this should be held, this is the time to do it. And Ms. Creamer. Thank you again, Ms. Mackey. So I know we discussed this before about having town halls at like some of the local schools or in the community. So can you just briefly kind of remember Fresh our memory about the challenges logistically and if we could make it work what may be some limitations so challenges I'll address that is that um, you know our video staff who does the production piece is limited we have one main person who that's their role um, but if you look here in the boardroom you see a camera here there's a camera here there's one behind me here for number five so you have five cameras within this room right so we're able to pull shots from five different cameras at any given time in this space so we take our live streaming equipment out which is what we do use for um, our graduations at the stadium um, other live events like it's academic um, 
you have two to three cameras, so your video is going to be a little bit more restricted or limited, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, you're limited in your audio components. You know, up here on the dais, you all have access to a mic, so at any point in time, we could mute your mic, we could raise the volume on your mic. There's three table mics here. You've got mic four, there's one over here. There's a, a little bit more capability here for the audio-visual piece um, than what we have the ability for at a, a remote location, which would be one of our schools. Mm -hmm. um, at times, we've had challenges in remote locations with the um, bandwidth or the Wi-Fi access, but um, I have been working with Ms. Thompson to make sure that like for our redistricting hearings, we're doing those at high schools um, for capacity reasons, we do have technology support and we will do a walkthrough and you know kind of test our equipment out in, in advance to try to prevent any issues from such as happening. Mm -hmm. um, a challenge for an off-site location in addition to the audiovisual piece is um, you know if we lose a Wi-Fi connection or a camera goes down and we're live streaming, mm -hmm. you know it may take us time to get that back up where here it's an easier, faster fix. Mm -hmm. um, but you know we did the town hall here in the spring mm -hmm. and it was packed. Mm -hmm. you know so there are limitations here for spacing. but if we did do a location off-site, maybe one of our high schools, we probably would pick with one of our newer facilities because we know the technology there is more current. Um, so I've worked with Mr. Graves to try to identify some schools where he would be, um, you know, have an easier time accessing some of the technology and the equipment that's already there versus going to, you know, an older facility. Um, I just, because I'm just, I know that we discussed this before, like I said, the challenges, and it, we did have a good turnout in March. Mm -hmm. um, but still acknowledging that there are some families who still may not have been able to attend mm -hmm. and that we may get an even larger mm -hmm. um, crowd if we were to um, you know, hold, hold some of these in, in the communities where, where some of these, the students go to school and where the families right. live. Um, so I, I'm just always gonna be in favor of um, some type of compromise there just because I know that accessibility is huge and not everyone can get here, you know, to the board, the, you know, the boardroom mm -hmm. to attend. Mm -hmm. So um, I just feel like, I mean, I'm thinking this through, but even with challenges, it may still be worthwhile to do it. Okay. Um, that, uh, those are just some, some of my thoughts. Um, about that, so thank you. So, Ms. Kramer, okay. make sure I understand. When you say in the community, so are you thinking of places other than schools and specifically other than high schools? Uh, I mean, the schools obviously would be, be ideal. Um, so, no, I'm not. I'm not thinking right. about necessarily anywhere else, but just thinking about the new. That gives that really limits us. What you describe because the newer high schools. I mean. What do we have, like St. Charles and North Point? So that's yeah. not, I mean, what about like on the Western side, mm -hmm. you know? We've done live streaming from all of our high schools mm -hmm. um, in okay. my time with the school system. Okay, okay. So, so if we could doable. do that, no, if we could do the high schools, I think, because we have high schools on each sort of region of Charles County, right. I think that that would be great. Um, that's a good option, in my opinion, if we could make that work. So does that answer your question, Jeremy? Thanks. No, I just, yeah, just want to make sure. Um, you know, even with the high school, I mean, if someone can't walk there, there's still the accessibility issue. So I, I just, I don't know how high school, it might be marginally easier for someone to get there rather than here. Um, so that's when you said in the community, I didn't know if you meant someplace else other than a, than a school. We have live stream yeah. too. It's like the school community. Right, like, okay. That's what I meant. Mm -hmm. We've done events at, um, again, I'm just speaking from my time here in the system at Pickawaxin. We've done a live streamed event at Mata Woman. So we've gone, our staff has yeah. gone to different facilities. I just think the preference is obviously schools that have newer technology so that the connection, the behind the scenes setup for our traveling equipment is a little bit easier to, to connect. Right. No, get that. Ms. Smith. No, um, completely echo Ms. Kramer's sentiments. Uh, definitely was plugging McDonough and Lackey mm -hmm. to see if sort of that side of the county was possible. I know it's not one of our new-ish high schools, but you mentioned being able to live stream. <clears throat> 
also thinking perhaps Facebook Live might be an option mm -hmm. if we were able to use the CCBOE sort of Facebook account and be able to live stream and connect parents that way. Right. Um, if for some reason those aren't viable options and we do have to go with central office, well, before I get into that point, I think it speaks volumes for us to be able to leave central office and physically go out into the community. And I know staff are always in schools and always in the community, but in terms of the board being able to host sessions of this type closer to where families live, I think speaks volumes for the work that we're trying to do. But I'll pivot and say, if that for some reason is not an option and we do have to go with central office, I would just ask that perhaps we figure out a way to add more chairs to the room. I don't know if we're at like our fire safety like capacity but perhaps there's a way of just being able to add additional seats so that we can seat more people in person. Thank you for that. You know, I think, I think too, the, the, the challenges become a lot easier as far as getting out to other parts of the county when you don't live stream. So that's, that's the other thing to think about. We can certainly record, and, and again, I don't know there, there's a challenge to that too, even in just recording, because you really only you have only have one camera. I mean, I I, 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 I set up. It's just yeah. connecting to the network to be able mm -hmm. to do that. And yeah. I did misspeak. We have never live streamed from Lackey. My ah. phone is connected to my watch, so Mr. Graves kindly yeah. reminded me <laughs> that we have not live streamed yeah. from Lackey so, before. I know we've done some filming there before, though, with maybe taped events. But. Um, I, Again, I don't know if it, if if the live streaming part presents an additional hurdle as opposed to just being able to film mm -hmm. and then have it available for people to see on on CCBOE or on the on the, the system YouTube channel. Right. Uh, if that makes it if that makes it easier, and um, I don't I don't know the answer to that, but that's just another another thing for. And Chairman, for, your point is taken. I just liken it to the days of when uh, Dr. Navarro first joined our system and she presented several town halls like in the community, right. one of which I attended at Thomas Stone mm -hmm. and how connected I felt sure, um, but they, to sort of yeah. what the superintendent was sharing and to the school system and wanting to learn more versus watching it live mm -hmm. um, from this room or being able to sit in this room. Correct, but those, and correct me if I'm wrong, but those town halls, weren't were they live streamed? I don't think they were. No. See, that's my point. No, that, that's, not, that's my point. They, I agree with you totally, but then the challenge is live streaming those events. Mm -hmm. so, so what's more important, being out there mm -hmm. or live streaming it? That's, that's the balance. Yeah. That's yeah. the balance. Yeah. 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 Another challenge, too, is that we have the ability um, in this particular space to do a virtual, a hybrid element. I don't know how we would make that work in an off-site at a school. You know, we use this technology here. Mrs. Morley is joining us virtual this evening. When we did our town hall in the spring, we did do a hybrid mix. That's true. So that's something we may have to eliminate if we go outside of here. Okay. Mr. Hancock? Yes. Well, actually, Shelly kind of brought uh, If I could. Um, I agree with what my colleague said. When I envisioned us doing these town halls, I was thinking if we would be rotating between the districts. Um, you know, just in the interest of, of fairness and accessibility, et cetera. Um, uh, but I, I understand your concerns, uh, which are very valid in terms of being able to live stream. And that was one of my questions about the hybrid piece, because I know we had quite a few people that joined us virtually, because for some people getting almost anywhere in Charles County by seven is going to be a challenge, depending on where they're working um, or whether or not they have childcare, et cetera. What is our capability? Um, for, and could it potentially be increased if there are people that say, I would like to join, I would like to be able to speak. However, you know, if it's going to be at you know, a central office, I can't get there, that won't work for me. Um, do, do we have any concerns about the maximum capability of people that could join um, virtually? I, in my knowledge scope with technology, um, and, and I don't want to call Ms. Thompson out, but I may ask Charmaine to help me yeah. respond to that, but I um, have never done a hybrid meeting outside of this meeting at another facility, so that's something that I would have to connect with technology staff on and work with Ms. Thompson to try to figure out what that would look like um, to offer that opportunity if we do it at different locations in the county. When I say locations, I mean school facilities. 
schools. Right. That's mm-hmm. what I was, I was envisioning initially. Hi, Ms. Morley. It's just Charmaine. If I'm understanding your question correctly, you're wondering if there would be a cap on the capacity of virtual attendees if we were to do town hall. Just with any um, platform such as Zoom or WebEx, obviously there are limitations built within, um, but certainly, obviously, people will be joining from their own virtual connections. So Mm -hmm. I don't see bandwidth being an issue it would be more so facilitating that and managing mm-hmm. that um, versus also, as uh, Ms. Mackey mentioned, um, the barriers of being able, like for instance, we have this technology in here, we have the aisle. If we were in another school with the participants, participants joining us virtually, be able to hear and see as well if they were not in the building physically. So I think that's more of some of the concerns we have with, but I I do think uh, we could make it happen. I think some of it just might be the old school approach if we rotate these uh, town halls where it may just be passing the mic and just have to put out the, um, the limitations to our general public that they may not be able to uh, be afforded some of the ways we have now with like seeing you as well as hearing you Mm -hmm. it just might be limitations we have but certainly explaining that to the public that some of the the uh, liberties we have here in the boardroom may not be afforded you know as we rotate but certainly just the bare bone basics that Mm -hmm. hearing the board members addressing their concerns allowing people to come speak we could do that um, I just think that some of the sophisticated technologies, it need, I wouldn't even say sophisticated, we've just kind of band-aid here, works for the interim and works for Kyle's equipment. Um, and I've spoken to my engineers, certainly we would do some more testing with him. And if we had a schedule ahead of time of where you want to have these town halls, just testing out the technology and, and letting you know as a board what are those uh, limitations, I think we could just make it work. But it certainly... There may be some instances where it might be a little bit old school, where you just have to pass the mic when it's your turn to speak, or the public knowing that they're not going to get to see everybody at once, or a camera might just be able to pan at one person. So those types of things. So. And the audio may not be super crisp. Oh, were you speaking with Becky? Yeah, I just said the audio may not be as crisp as it is in here as well. So that's just something to okay. think about, too. Well, a follow-up question. You did mention about staff. Could this potentially impose a, you know, a additional burden on staff to have it at different locations? To your point about all of the, the things that are involved, which, you know, those of us that aren't as tech savvy had done. I was like, what, there's five cameras? I mean, I'm, I'm larger than you. <laughs> you know, is that one of your concerns? Uh, it, well, for my staff, no. I've already asked them for all hands on deck to do these, so even my engineers, I've asked that they be present uh, at these town halls and my computer analyst specialist. Like for instance, right now we have a board meeting, I'll have one tech on working late. Obviously if we do town halls, I've asked not only a tech but an engineer to be present. So certainly, we're. All, I've already told my team it'll be all hands on deck initiative if we were to do this. So I, at least from my side, I don't see that. But I do know Ms. Mackey's team, it's a party of one. Kyle is mm-hmm. the only videographer, so it could be a certain impact for him. Yeah, Yeah, and you know, I I think we had this conversation, um, discussion maybe at a board meeting in August, maybe back in June, where, you know, I talked about that limitation where there are six of us in the communications team. My background is not video. Um, Kyle does, you know, that's 100% of his work. So, for instance, this evening helping him film um, the meeting is one of our web content specialists who's done training. We do do a lot of cross training. Um, but if we continue to do things outside of this equipment here, um, you know, staffing for me, Kyle's our main person. Um, I would be interested in trying to either, you know, offer more professional development to our current team members or um, looking to try to expand someone with that video knowledge on our team. Um, it, it is challenging to find someone with that type of background as well. Um, I will share that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can imagine. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Morley.
Mr. Hancock, did you have something? Yeah, I just want to, I mean, you know, I don't really have a, per, a, a preference either way, whether we have it here or if we have it out in the community. I, I do, I think what we need to think about is how many people can, can we actually reach being here versus a remote site. If we can reach more people through technology by being here, then maybe this is a place to do it. If we can reach more people by going into the communities and rotating where people um, rotating different uh, areas of the county um, I think that's a great idea I think that if we do do that um, we may just have to record a video and not worry so much about the the um, live the, the live stream and being able to to dial up through a zoom or a WebEx to be able to have the have it that way so I I don't have a big preference either way it's whatever works easiest and is more effective I'm okay with all right, thanks. Ms. Thomas, anything? Uh, my only thing would be security, you know, because we do have some that's not, you know, so nice. Oh, <laughs> oh for people honest. coming in remotely, you mean? Right. Yeah, that's, that's uh, a fair concern. Okay. Understood. Um, so, student board member, Ms. Perkins. So, so you were not part of the last town hall that we had. Um, so what exactly like happens in a town hall? So it's more interactive to where people can ask questions and the board and staff can answer okay. people from the public rather than, than, than what you see here. Okay. And people can come out and talk about anything that, that they'd like. Oh, okay. So, um, so if, I'm, if I'm hearing correctly, I, I think I think we'd like to try someplace else other than here. Is that a fair assessment? I think I'd like more information on what it looks like to try in another place. I do hear the balance between wanting to ensure that we have enough AV right. to reach people virtually who are able to connect, um, especially Ms. Morley raised childcare and there are other issues with trying to physically you mm -hmm. know, get someplace by seven. Um, so I think just wanting to better understand like do we actually have true challenges and issues out in these community in our community high schools or do well, we that answer is yes there's 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 challenges to doing it in a high school so I'll, I'll but adjourn. I think I also heard Ms. Thompson saying that she might have to look into like what those challenges might look like and if there are workarounds so I so maybe I'm misunderstanding Ms. Thompson's talking about people dialing in remotely mm -hmm. okay the challenge, no matter where we go, is live streaming, regardless of whether people are able to, to come in remotely. So that challenge to live stream exists no matter where we go. You know, hard stop, next sentence. Setting up something so where people can dial in is what um, we'd have to look into from a remote site. Is that, is that fair? Right. Mm -hmm. I can't really speak to Kyle's equipment. I don't right. know on that. But at least right. even when I think it, you guys swearing in ceremony, his live stream went out. And, went out, right. And unfortunately, yeah. then we had to play the video afterwards. So I think that's more of the, the concern is not knowing how that's going to run. And obviously, those in that situation, you're not going to know it until you know it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but also, yeah. too, in here, um, you know, everybody's wired to a mic, so the audio in here is phenomenal. When we live stream, you take that, it's a whole set of really expensive equipment that we're taking to another facility. Mm -hmm. It's not equipment that you can hook up as many mics, um, so your audio will be affected. Um, Sorry. Gotcha. No, it's okay. Superintendent, if you could. You have a so I just want to weigh in because we just need to move forward yeah. and make a decision. Um, and so staff just wants to make you super hyper aware of all the what ifs. We could also pull this off um, and it could work somewhat well. Um, I hear very strongly the interest from multiple board members that we do um, uh, that we get out to the community. Um, if the board is okay with this. We have three of them happening, one in November, um, I think one in January. I can't really recall the dates, but there's three of them, November, February, and April. Um, we could try a November one outside this room. 
um, we will try to go after the best facility that we think we can um, set up for a whole bunch of reasons, both in Charmaine's um, shop and in Shelly's shop. Um, my suggestion is that we do one here because we know what we can produce here. We know we can get the owl working, we know the acoustics, um, and then maybe another one at another site. I think we'll learn by getting out there and learning it. Um, and I know that board members are interested that we um, get out to multiple schools. I, I don't foresee this board not doing town hall meetings every year. So maybe this is also a learning experience so that we cover over multiple years different schools. And one year, you know, we could try out Lackey and just know that if we can't get live, you know, we let our community know we may be challenged by these two components, but we will for sure record and have it showing later. But I think it's important. What I hear from, from my board is an interest in being in the community. So if there can be a compromise of at least knowing that one of the three sessions we know we're gonna do here, we know that we can zoom in people that wanna do it from their living rooms. We know we are, you know, we don't have as many seats, but we know we'll have the, the technical uh, capabilities here and then trying out maybe two and two other places where we feel like we hear you, we wanna be in different parts of the county and then what would those possible options be that we think it'll be most effective. Ms. Kramer. I was just gonna say, I think for me, uh, that's that's an agreeable compromise. I, I, I could agree to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. An agreement as well. I think that sounds good. All right, thanks everybody. Um, so that was item one that we need to discuss. <laughs> item two, <laughs> with regard to the town halls, is is a, a kickoff theme, if you will. Um, so I will open it up if anyone has anything they would like to um, suggest uh, as far as a topic. Last time was um, school safety, correct, Ram? Yeah. And um, discipline is school discipline. Is that what I heard, Miss Thomas? Yes. Yeah. One thing could yes. maybe could be fundraising because I know one students have questions about it, and also like parents are wondering like what are they fundraising for, what are they going to, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. That's that, how you do fundraising the same way. So I got your email. We can talk about that and at, at another at a, another venue. Um, but certainly that's something that someone could, if they wanted to come out to the town hall and, and discuss, that would that would be fine. Um, Ms. Smith. Uh, so I would recommend that one of the topics be on family engagement. <coughs> Excuse me. I think we're coming off of a. I don't want to call it a high, but I'm call it a high yeah. mm -hmm. in terms of how various schools positively kicked off with lots of open houses and engagement. And so just wanting to hear from the superintendent in terms of like, what's her expectation for how building leaders and administrators should be engaging the community? What are those opportunities for community members, families, gardens to participate in their, their local school? Um, I know we've talked about, excuse me, in a past meetings about wanting to get more school volunteers and recognizing that certain schools and certain places in our county don't have enough. And so what might that look like to help recruit volunteers from other places in the county to these schools? So I like that and. Well, thank you. And then, <laughs> no, and then I'm thinking actually one of the questions that you just emailed me, Ms. Perkins, I think we could roll into that about fundraising and boosters and things like that. Some of the, the groups that you have um, the, do we still call it the PAC parent? I mean, or, um, I think all those initiatives that we could talk about to show where people could help in their school. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything down to coming in to read once a week to kids, things like that. Right. We still have read across America. Okay. Um, even more than even that. The volunteer I'm, process in terms yeah. of how parents, guardians, community members can get, um, screened and I don't want to say certified, but whatever the process is to become a volunteer in the school, the background check. Can I ask yeah. you a clarifying question? Please. So 
Are we following the model where there is um, an, a theme where staff are able to make a presentation on a specific topic and then the community is able to come in and talk about anything else that they want to talk about? Because I think that the, what, mm -hmm. I, what I, so I'm thinking about two things. I am having a state of the schools on October 12th, plug for myself, yeah. <laughs> Charles High School at six o'clock um, with translations and Espanol. Um, and, um, and then we're doing some breakout by schools. And I am addressing um, uh, the parents and the families and the communities with the state of the schools from their vantage point. So when you talk about how can you be engaged and so forth, that is a little bit of what I'm, I'm gonna be talking about. But there won't be enough time for Indeed. sort of that, that conversation. And I'm mm -hmm. just curious, as the board thinks about its town halls, I also wonder if you have thought about facilitated conversations at tables where it's not just people talking at you, mm -hmm. uh, meaning the board, and the board trying to answer or staff answering on behalf of the board, but facilitated conversations and ideas and questions and answers that can also look different. And so I, I and I just want to be prepared. So as, so just wanting to ask a little bit more about what you what you would like those two hours how would you like those two hours to flow so i'll jump in i think kind of what we did last time where we had a presentation up front people could speak on that but can, they can speak on anything um but that that's the way i envision it um but from what you just said were you thinking more in how we did those the student town hall where we sat down and and, and students kind of rotated and talked to us i mean i don't mind that capturing that though is yeah. a logistics nightmare capturing yeah. that on video is just wouldn't wouldn't work yeah and i think that's yeah the, the, that's a good point that's a good point um, um i was thinking something either around academics or maybe mental health um you know, in terms of, you know, two of the things that, that I get feedback on most often. Another thing I thought about, and I know this is a very broad subject, but um, the, the parent um, handbook slash calendar, there's a lot of information in there that I think people are just unaware of. Um, and um, understanding, too, that, you know, more exciting topics are what are going to get people out. So... And I don't know if, if, you know, there's, and this is where it would have been helpful probably to maybe to survey people. Um, and, you know, I understand we don't always get, you know, a ton of responses, but even if we got, you know, a few hundred or a couple of thousand, that would be great. That would be a good starting point for people. Um, but that, that's what I was thinking of. Uh, under academics, maybe either, you know, eligibility, or I get a lot of feedback around a lot of the testing that the students have to do and, and understanding, you know, what that means and what, what's done with that information or even um, what we recently put out in terms of, um, you know, how our students are, are compared to um, other students uh, statewide and what does that mean and what does that look like and, you know, are we making adequate progress? You know, just understanding that that is the core of what we're doing is, is the student progress and student academics. Yeah, I, I hear you, Miss Morley. I think I think a lot of what you just said, plug back to October twelfth, uh, town hall or, or state of the school address. Um, those are things that the superintendent is going to talk about. Um, I, yeah, but it, it's yeah. the piece about the parents and the community being able to address specific questions. And I don't know if this would be a good, and maybe it would. It would be a good follow up. The first state of the schools is on the twelfth. And then the community gets an, an opportunity um, to follow up. Right. So, okay, Ms. Creamer. Did you have something? No, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so to Ms. Morley's point, and that was gonna be one of my ideas was to, if possible, survey the community to find out about topics that they, would be of interest to them. Um, I would definitely be in favor of that. Um, but I also had some other ideas um, around 
town hall topics. So um, piggybacking off of Ms. Morley on mental health, so I'd like to have some focus on um, sort of the behavioral health supports that are available in the school to not only the students but to the families, um, thinking about like community mediation um, and sort of the outside um, partner agencies that we have, so kind of a presentation about that, about what's available inside the school and then what partnership agencies we work with because as we know, mental health is still, you know, um, very, um, I don't want to say hot topic, I don't know, I'm not falling on the right words here, but it's really important to our community um, and it's gotten obviously a lot of um, attention, you know, deservingly so, um, particularly since COVID. And I think that um, we still have an issue with parents and families not knowing about the resources that are available and that the school can help connect them to. Um, and if you know you've ever tried to even make an appointment in the last couple of years uh, with a behavioral health provider, it's really difficult mm -hmm. to do. So for families to know about the resources available within the school and then the agencies that we work with that we could kind of help connect them to if they're in need of those um, resources. And then we can also sort of talk about um, the mental health first aid that we're offering um, to families, just all of the services that are available that I think you know, we still have some families that aren't aware. So um, that's that's one of mine. And then um, another topic is, um, I don't know exactly how we could address this, but sort of a focus on CTE. So I know we've on, talked about CTE, CTE. Okay. yes, yeah, CTE, yeah. Um, career and technical education yeah. programs. Um, we've talked about this before about how there's a common misconception that there's only programs available at one high school, North Point High School, which we all know is not true. Um, but a lot of that, kind of still circulating um, and also even about the application processes for the different schools because you know some families are under the impression that it's done one way and that's not the case because you know they hear rumors and things like that um, and if they've you know maybe their child hasn't reached that point in their academic career or they've just never had any experience with it they may not know mm -hmm. um, about the options available one to what the process is um, you know, and that there are multiple programs available at all of the high schools. Um, so I really think, I don't know if we could tie that into some type of academics, but. That's actually a very good one. I, I think that's one that mm -hmm. would garner a lot of interest. CTE, for sure. CTE, and, mm -hmm. and uh, to have a snippet about each of the programs that we have. Yeah. And that's, that wouldn't be too hard to put together right and um and maybe we could even have a couple students come out and talk about that would their be experience excellent. yeah that would be great in the, in the programs you could even plug in your um the new career counselors yeah. that are at the middle school level right right mm -hmm. right yeah. and then the, the let's all good stuff okay. but but the last time we had about 20 minutes of a presentation mm -hmm. and the rest of the time Mm -hmm. for people to speak so finding that balance I mean if we're going to say we give half an hour or something I mean we, we could give two hours in each of the things that we talked about so right. no I agree I, I like the la the format we did last time right. uh, where we did the presentation for about 20 minutes or so and then okay. open the floor to let folks ask questions the other thing that we can also do as I think about this um, is we can um, have people take stuff with them, right? Mm -hmm. So we yeah. want we want a lot of elementary parents to come to the CTE presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. then we want, for sure, middle school parents. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and maybe freshman and sophomore parents. But, you know, um, so I'm also thinking about the opportunities of takeaways yes. or follow-throughs or here's the phase, how to mm -hmm. connect with somebody. Mm -hmm for follow-up questions. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'll share with you too, um, real quick, Dr. Navarro, I meant to tell you this, I was at J.P. Ryan's uh, open house and um, Ms. Proctor, mm -hmm. you know, their new community school coordinator, um, and she's been in the county for a while, but um, anyhow, she's in her new role there, but she had a table set out um, at the open house of like just that, like handouts about different things, about resources in the community, mm -hmm. about things that the school, um, offers a, a survey for parents um, with QR codes and the whole nine yards, you know, um, about kind of what do you need from your community school coordinator and just everything, how to put money on your kid's lunch account. I mean, just so many things. It was, the table was full of resource information because they knew they were going to have families there and they could just grab 
and go. And she also had a, tr a lot of it translated into Spanish, which was great. Um, so I love that idea of, you know, using the opportunity to have um, a large number of our community in one place and to provide additional information to them. So I think that's a great idea. And, and I also am thinking about the timing of the year um, of what, because a lot of it is, is sort of trans, you know, the timing when this could also happen is at the transition for pl planning for next year. Um, so even the April sessions or maybe February, we could think about that um, as an option. Mm -hmm. All of these are really right. robust. So I'd also like to make sure that we continue the practice of capturing the FAQs. I think that people found that helpful yeah. and, and posting those as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So CTE, can we can we yeah. agree to that? Miss Morley, you good with CTE? I'll support it, but it's not my first choice. Thank you. We'll remember that when we do the next one. <laughs> okay. Very good. Okay. Thanks, everybody. That was good discussion. All right. Now we're going to move on to action items. So, thank you so much. I'm sorry. Thank you. So, we're going to come back to what we just heard. Um, the first on the list is the amendment to the school calendar at this time the chair will entertain a motion to approve the modified calendar as presented and shown so moved second it's moved by miss smith and seconded by miss creamer is there any discussion by the way you vote on this too yeah any discussion on that Ms. Morley, any discussion? No, sir. Okay. Thank you. All right, thanks. Okay, seeing none. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Aye. Thank you very much. All right, that's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, next um, is the superintendent's contract, which um, the board has voted on in. in executive session we need to do this publicly so um, I will read this um, so the board uh, or rather um, the chair will ent entertain a motion for the board to amend the superintendent's contract uh, retroactive to 1 July 2023 to provide the superintendent with a 4% raise in consideration of the work performed by the superintendent So moved. Okay, it's moved by Ms. Smith and seconded by Ms. Morley. There's no discussion on this one. So um, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Aye. Voting, voting yes is Ms. Thomas, Ms. Smith, Ms. Kramer, myself, and Ms. Morley. Those opposed? Mr. Hancock, thank you very much. That passes five to one. Uh, so the last thing are on the agenda is the update to uh, policy 7230, new school construction site acquisition and school naming. Um, this came before us at our last board meeting and this was um, uh, this was a modification from the original presentation that we saw in August, and it's here before us tonight as an action item. At this time, the chair will seek a motion to approve. Made by Ms. Kramer. Second. Second by Ms. Smith. Okay. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing no discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Aye. Okay, and that is a unanimous vote. All right, my agenda says the next thing is adjournment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I have moved that we adjourn. All right. Made by Miss Morley, seconded by Miss Creamer. 
All those in favor, please raise. Oh, please raise your hand. I just want to say, if I could, publicly for the record, um, Ms. Ms. Butler Washington needed to leave, but on the three things that we just voted on, her opinion was um, a yes vote on all three of those things. Just want to make that known for the record. All right, thank you very much.